Thank you very much, Sherry. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you very much for joining uh, the Rosenberg Forum's uh, third webinar uh, of the, uh, I would say, based on academic year. Um, and uh, we are delighted that you are able to join us. Um, this particular forum, and it's as the it title reveals, uh, deals with the international transboundary water issue, uh, one of the, the most important river basins in the world. And I'm delighted that we have an ex excellent group of speakers and uh, moderators that will um, manage the next hour and a half plus uh, uh, webinar. At this point, I'd like to ask my colleague the Vice President of the University of California for Agriculture and Natural Res Resources, Dr. Glenda Hummiston, to uh, greet you. Thank you, Sarush, and welcome to all of our participants. We're really thrilled to have you here with us today. As Sarush mentioned, I serve as Vice President for Agriculture and Natural Resources for the University of California system. And we are honored to host the Rosenberg International Forum on Water Policy. The forum was created in 1996 with an endowment from the Bank of America to us to honor the retiring bank president, Richard Rosenberg. Normally, the forum is held every other year in different locations around the world where we host 50 water scholars and senior water managers to participate in interactive discussions about the science of water management and different experiences in water management around the globe. <clears throat> Unfortunately, during this challenging time of COVID-19, when in-person interactions are not possible, the Rosenberg Forum remains committed to our mission of reducing conflict and promoting cooperation in the management of water resources. Given the need to delay our 11th biennial Rosenberg Forum on water policy, <clears throat> which was originally planned to be held this past November 2020 in, uh, in partnership with Northwest uh, Ag and Forestry University, Yangling in China, the Rosenberg Advisory Committee is excited to offer this series of virtual engagement and learning opportunities. So again, welcome for joining us today, and I hope you enjoy our offering on flashpoints and water conflicts, the case of the Nile River. Saroosh, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Glenda. Um, at this point, uh, I invite all members of our advisory board uh, to introduce themselves. So we will go according to the listing that is provided on the, um, on the Zoom. Uh, Thank you, Sirs. Good morning, everyone, afternoon, wherever you may be. My name is Christina Babbitt. I manage our California Groundwater Program at Environmental Defense Fund, which is an international environmental nonprofit. Good to see everyone. So good, good morning and afternoon. And my name is Lucia De Stefano. I am uh, um, uh, associate professor at the uh, Universita Complutense de Madrid in Spain and also um, Deputy Director of the Water Observatory uh, of the Putin Foundation, which is a think tank uh, devoted to uh, water policy. Good day, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Ariel Dinar. I am with the School of Public Policy at the University of California, Riverside, and I work on issues related to water in California and uh, abroad. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Qiyun Duan from Hoha University in Nanjing, China. And uh, my, uh, my area of research is uh, uh, surface hydrology and uh, the impact of climate change on water resources. Good morning, good afternoon. This is Alberto Garrido. I'm a professor of agriculture, natural resource <laughs> economics of Universidad Politécnica de Madrid, Technical University of Madrid, and I'm also the director of the Water Observatory of the Botin Foundation, uh, which is a uh, co-organizer of this sem series of seminars with the Rosenberg Forum. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Andrea Gerlach. I'm with the University of Arizona. I am a professor in the School of Geography, Development, and the Environment, 
and the Associate Director for the Udall Center for Studies in Public Policy, and my work is on water policy and governance. Welcome, happy you're with us today. Hello, my name's Helen Ingram, and I'm a longtime uh, participant in Rosenberg Forums. I am an emerita professor at the University of California at Irvine, and I am also uh, a professor emeritus of uh, the uh, University of Arizona, and I am with Andrea in beautiful, warm Tucson. Hi, good morning, Ben Maddox. Uh, I am the newest member of the advisory committee. I actually started officially, I think, three days ago. So thank you very much for having me. I am a senior vice president in the food, ag, and wine executive for the Western region for uh, Bank of America. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Ayman Rabi. I am the executive director of Palestinian Hydrology Group, which is a non-government organization working on the water issues. And myself, I am a water resources uh, engineer. And Doug, uh, yes. would you I'll kindly introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. You've all met Glenda. Um, my name is Doug Parker. I'm the director of the California Institute for Water Resources and um, oversee the Rosenberg program as part of my program. Thank you all, and uh, like everyone else on the advisory board, we are excited about today's webinar. And at this point, I'd like to ask uh, my two, uh, our two moderators, um, Ayman Rabi and uh, Helen Ingram, who have uh, worked hard to put this uh, webinar for today uh, together. And uh, Ayman, I'll pass on the baton to you for the rest of the meeting until the end. So thank you very much, uh, Saroosh. Thank you, uh, all participants and distinguished speakers, dear colleagues, and dear distinguished guests. It is a great honor uh, for me to moderate this session together with my good friend, Helen. And I hope we will be able to overcome any difficulty that might come, including technical difficulties, uh, despite the fact that this is a, a very hot subject and it is a very important subject related to the Nile Basin. Uh, we managed finally to get a balanced representation from the region and I would like to thank on behalf of the Rosenberg Forum and the University of California and the Advisory Board, all the distinguished speakers who agreed to uh, give, give us their contribution to this very important seminar. Uh, we have uh, five speakers, five distinguished speakers uh, representing various disciplines. We have political sciences, we have hydrology and we have economics and we have uh, uh, legal uh, and law or international law. And that also give us a kind of a multidisciplinary uh, insight into the subject that we are going to address. Uh, without further uh, uh, like uh, speeches, Helen, do you want to say something before I just move to introduce the first speaker? No, unmute yourself, Helen. Helen. I only want to invite people to please post uh, their questions for the speaker. Uh, in that uh, Q&A box uh, so that we can ask those at the end of the session. Thank you, Ayman. Yeah. It's, thank you, thank you, Helen. I think just also to remind participants that we will not have uh, questions or Q&A after each presentation, but we will have a final session for Q&A where as just Helen mentioned, we'll have all Q&As uh, posted in the Q&A or in the chat box. And uh, after that, uh, after the presenters finishing their speeches, we will have this session. And I hope you will be able to stay with us until the end so that we can address this uh, uh, correctly and properly. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, start with the first presenter, Dr. Salman Salman. Uh, Dr. Salman Salman, as you also could see from his biography, uh, is an academic researcher and he's a consultant in water law and policy. He is also the editor-in-chief of the Brill Research Perspective in International Water Law. He is a fellow in the International Water Association and a formal, formal, uh, former World Bank advisor in water law. Dr. Salman, the floor is yours, and please just stick to the time uh, mentioned in the, in, the, in the presentation. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Ayman, for the introduction. Uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, I'll be talking about the Nile Basin, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, and international water law. Dr. Salman, could you put your presentation in presentation mode, please? Okay. Just in the lower, yeah, there you go, in the lower. I have to. Okay. getting some technical assistance. Yeah, we can all use that. <laughs> In the lower right, the little picture right by the slider bar, if you just click that, you'll be good to go. Right down where you see the book, right next to it. All right here. There you go. Perfect. Well, maybe. <laughs> It's not moving. So, yeah, let's go up to slideshow then. Would you like us to share it for you? Yes, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I don't know why it's not working. It's not, it's not we're clicking on the slideshow, but it's not moving. Maybe okay. Can, share it. Can, can you, can you? Yes. Can you, can you share it? Yes, just a moment. I'm sorry, I'm opening it up. I'm sorry, I didn't have it ready to go. Oh, there we go. I mean, you cursed us with your, hopefully no technical issues. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I tried, I tried, but unfortunately it seems that we, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> We're ready to go now. Okay, fine. So we have it. You're, you're going to do it, right? Yes. Can you see it on your screen? Yeah, I can see it on the screen, yeah. Okay. Just uh, let me know when you want to go to next. Okay. So we are, uh, I hope that, 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 that time is not part of my time. Mm -hmm. Whatever we have to spend. Okay, so we can move to the next uh, next screen. Uh, the structure of the presentation. Uh, I'll talk about the political geography of the Nile, and then the basic principles of international water law, uh, as opposed to the agreements on the on the Nile. And then I will uh, give an give an overview of the programs and projects on the Nile, and that will lead us to the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, where I will talk about the developments since uh, 2011. Uh, up to now, including the agreements that were, uh, were were concluded, the differences between the three parties and the attempts to resolve them, and the role of the third parties, uh, number of third parties uh, have been uh, have been engaged, and we'll, we'll talk briefly about the role of each of them, and then we'll conclude with some remarks about possible areas of cooperation within the Nile, uh, as opposed to the current uh, dispute, and uh, we'll leave the panelists to the question as to which they think the Nile Basin uh, is flowing or heading. Uh, next. Next, Helen. Sure. Okay, political geography of the Nile, next. Uh, we spoke, we heard Suruj talking about uh, one of the greatest rivers, the Nile is one of the greatest river. It's the longest river in the world, uh, 6,650 uh, 6, kilometers. Uh, in, uh, the White Nile, one of the tributaries, flow originate from the largest lake, uh, second largest lake in the world, uh, the uh, Lake Victoria, second larger after uh, Lake Superior. We also have the largest swamps in southern Sudan, the Sud, what is called the Sud region. We have the oldest and largest dams, starting with the uh, old uh, Swan Dam in the uh, 19th century. And then we have the oldest and most controversial treaties. And this is one, one basic characteristic of the Nile. Now again, we, we hear about the Nile being the cradle of civilization. Currently 250 million people live or depend on the Nile. And the figure expected to rise to 300 billion by 2025. This represents about 10% of the African continent. And we have a huge diversity in ethnicity, religions, and linguistic, and, and, and linguistic diversity. The Nile is shared by 11 countries, Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo, Egypt, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Kenya, 
Rwanda, South Sudan, Sudan, Tanzania, and Uganda. You will see later that they have varying and different interests and stakes. And it is a, it's a region of extremes, poverty, nine out of 15 poorest countries in the world are in the Nile area, uh, high variability and climate change. And then we also have the landscape vulnerability. Next, please. Next. Uh, the, uh, it's a small flow of system. We talk about 84 billion cubic meters. Uh, some, some, some new estimates uh, put the figure as 109 billion cubic meters. Whatever, if it's 84 or 109, it is really small flow uh, given the big name of the Nile. And we can see the small flow when we compare it to the Amazon. The Nile is really 2% of the Amazon. You need 50 Niles to get one Amazon. The 6% of the Congo, 12% of the Yangtze River, 17% of the Niger River, and even Zambezi River. It's uh, one quarter of Zambezi River. Uh, so this is a small flow uh, system-wide. And we have very limited infrastructure. About 10% of the hydroelectric power potential has been developed so far. 15% of the population uh, in the 11 countries have electricity. Uh, less than 10% of the land, irrigable land is irrigated. If, this is excluding Egypt and Sudan, which has a large uh, area of irrigable land. And we spoke about the high rain variability, right, rainfall variability across the basin. Ethiopia, tributaries contribute 86 to 95%, depending on the season of the year, uh, of the flow at Swan. Uh, high equatorial flows lost in the Sud, as I mentioned earlier, about 60% of the water coming from the White Nile is lost in the Sud. Huge area of the Sud, about 60% uh, uh, 60, 60 is lost. Uh, the White Nile contributes about 14%. As this is one region. We have the, the, extreme, the variability also, uh, we can see that in Egypt, minimal, minimal, minimal rain, no flow additions, yet 90% of the population live on 5% of the Nile land. Sudan and South Sudan have 65% of the basin area. After the uh, independence or breakaway of South Sudan, it's about 40, uh, 40, 25, 44, 45, 20, sorry, 45 for Sudan and 20 for South Sudan. It's the basin area, the confluence of major tributaries uh, uh, in the two countries. Next, please. Uh, there are lots of challenges, as I mentioned, limited flow, one of 184, 84 billion to 109, increasing demand for due to population growth. We mentioned the population growth and we talked about the figure rate reaching 300 million. And we have the current allocation of the Nile waters, mostly, by, mostly used by Sudan and Egypt. We have the climate change and environmental degradation. We have major differences uh, on international law interpretation, on the treaties, and on the current uh, Nile Basin Cooperative Framework Agreement that was negotiated for almost 10 years. And the result of all of this is the unilateral development plans. This is one basic characteristic of a Nile. Unilateral development plans, you hardly find any project that is developed by two or, or more of the countries of the Nile. And the just unilateral development plans are mainly dams, and the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is one of them. Next, please. Uh, this is uh, the areas where we have the, the dams. In Egypt, we have the high dam, and we have a number of barrages. Sudan, we have a number of dams, starting with Senar Dam, and then Roseris Dam, Jebel Aulia, and then Marawi now, and then Ethiopia, we have a number of dams, which we'll also talk about, Finsha, Tis Abai, Atane Belize, and then the Grand Ethiopian Essence Dam, and then we have in Uganda also a number of dams, uh, Bujagali, Kuroma. So the basically Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Uganda are really the countries that have the largest number of dams uh, and, uh, in the, on the basin, on the Nile Basin. Next, please. Uh, this is the contribution of each of the Nile main tributaries. The Blue Nile, the largest of the of the uh, tributaries of the Nile, uh, the flow is 50 billion cubic meters, representing about close to 60 percent. That's where we have our current dispute. The White Nile, 11.5 billion cubic meters, representing 14 percent. The Sobat, uh, again, this, uh, 11.5, uh, representing 14 percent, and the Adbara, 11, representing 13 percent. So we have this is the on the assumption that the total flow is 84 billion cubic meters, distribution between the main. So we see the Blue Nile, which is the topic of uh, our, our, our uh, discussion today, is really the largest of, of all. In fact, combined, the, three, the other three combined are still below 
the, to the fl their total flow is below the flow of the of the Blue Nile. Next, please. Uh, again, this is just uh, the 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 uh, comparison between the annual flow and the flood period flow, July to September. So at Barab, 13% is, is the annual, but 22% is the uh, is the is the flood period, July to September, beginning of July to end of September. And the Blue Nile, the same thing, 59 is the average, but 68% comes during the flood season, during those three months. And this is one major problem which we'll, we'll talk about. That 68% of the total flow of the, of the Blue Nile, uh, where the Grand Rissons Dam is, is, being, is being constructed, comes during the months of July, August, and September. So about 14% is annual, but 5% uh, during, during the flood. The, the, we'll see that the total coming from Ethiopia is 86% during the, annual, the, the, the average, but 95% during the flood season, while the White Nile, which is coming from the equatorial lakes, is 14% and only 5% during the flood season. So it's very, very wide variation. Next, please. Uh, this is this, uh, you, we, we hear often about the Eastern Nile and Southern Nile, and I thought, uh, just to give a, a, a quick view of the Southern Nile. When we talk about the Southern Nile, we're talking about the, the, uh, the equatorial lakes Nile, or where the White Nile originates, and the, the main White Nile. And you have, here we have Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi. And those are the countries that where Lake Victoria, the White Nile comes from Lake Victoria and enters South Sudan. And then we have the Eastern Nile, which is, is uh, uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, Egypt, and Eritrea. And then, but, but Sudan and Egypt really, and South Sudan can be classified as belonging to both the Southern Nile and the Eastern Nile. And so since we are going to talk about the Eastern Nile today, we need to keep in mind Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt, and to a lesser extent, Eritrea. Next, please. Uh, this is the basin area in each country. I don't want to spend much time about it. I mentioned earlier that about 65% of it in Sudan and South Sudan. Ethiopia has 11%, Egypt has about 9%. Uganda has 7%, but let's look at Uganda. It has 7%, but 99% of the country falls in the Nile Basin. Similarly, Rwanda has less than 1%, but 80% of the country falls within the Nile Basin. So we have, again, this uh, variation uh, between, the, between so many factors and the basin area is one of them. Next. Uh, the repairs, mistakes, and interest. I mentioned earlier that the, 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 we have 11 countries, but really we can classify them into four categories. E Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudan, and South Sudan, the stakes and the interest are very high. Uganda, uh, the interest are high. And then we have Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, and Tanzania. The interest and the stakes are medium. And then Democratic Republic of Congo and Eritrea, the interest and stakes are very low. Democratic Republic of Congo has the River Congo, which is more than mentioned, mentioned area 20 times the Nile flow. And Eritrea is really has a very minimal flow that the CT River, which originates in Ethiopia, uh, crosses into Eritrea and then joins the Adbara River. So those are basically the, st the, inter the stakes and interest. Next. Uh, next, uh, we will talk about international water law quickly and compare that to the Nile agreements. The, when we talk about international water law, I'm to basically talking about the United Nations Convention uh, on the Law of the Navigation Uses of Water Courses, what is called the UN Water Courses Convention. This convention was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1997, and it basically represent uh, the basic principles there represent customary international law, meaning that the all that the convention did was to codify the existing principles of customary international law, which which binds every country. Uh, the, uh, the, as I mentioned, uh, 103 countries voted for the convention. Only three voted against the convention. We'll come to that in a minute. The convention was opened for signature, entered into force in 2014. It needed 35 member countries uh, to, 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 to ratify it. Currently, it has 36 parties. It's a framework convention. It is really a framework convention, meaning, meaning it lays down the basic principles and leaves the details for the parties to complement them by agreements between them. The main thing I would like to say about the convention is the, the, uh, the its cardinal principle. The cardinal principle, the cardinal base is cooperation. It talks about cooperation, cooperate, and uses the term 15 times. Cooperation, cooperate 15 times. And basically we talk about international water law as the law of cooperation. 
the main principles of the convention, uh, equitable and reasonable utilization and participation of all riparians, the obligation not to cause significant harm. And those two principles are really, uh, have been the, the, the centrifugal of the, the evolution of international water law. We have the notification for planned measures and exchange of data, it's, it's another, uh, uh, another basic principle. And then we have the environmental protection and preservation and the peaceful settlement of disputes. Those are the main five principles of custom international law which have been codified in the convention. And as, as I mentioned, most provisions of the convention reflect custom international law. And as such, because, and because of that, those, provi those provisions of custom international law bind the states, uh, whether they are parties to the convention or not. And this has appeared in the decisions of the International Court of Justice in two cases where the parties at that time were not even members of the convention, but the, the, uh, the International Court of Justice referred to the convention as representing custom international law. Next, please. Uh, those are the countries that are members of the uh, of the convention 36 uh, uh, mostly in the europe and middle east and africa uh, I, we can get to this during discussion if, if there are any questions next uh, within the nile countries I, I thought i would stop for a minute and show where the nile countries uh, the stand of the nile countries with the visa convention two countries voted for the convention kenya and sudan four countries abstained but they abstained for different reasons. Each country has its own reasons for abstaining. Egypt abstained, Ethiopia abstained, Rwanda abstained, and Tanzania abstained. Burundi voted against the convention. It's one of the three countries. The other two countries that voted against the convention were China and Turkey. And then uh, the Congo and Eritrea did not participate in the, just in the, in the discussion and the vote. Next. Uh, go ahead. Next, yeah, we'll talk about the agreements on the Nile. We have a large number of agreements on the Nile, starting with 1891 and going on until the recent one, which is the Cooperative Framework Agreement. I don't want to go to them because that will take a lot of time, but those are some of, most of those are called colonial treaties by the, some of the Nile riparian countries because they were concluded during the colonial era in Africa. And that's one major issue for the parties that the parties, uh, some of the, uh, the upper agreements are talking about those agreements as colonial treaties which do not bind them. And the, why Egypt and Sudan would, would insist on, on, on their binding effect. Next, please. But, and this is particularly true, next. Uh, this is particularly true about the 1902 treaty between Britain and Ethiopia, uh, which gave, gave uh, Sudan, which gives Sudan and Egypt a V2 power over projects in Ethiopia, which Ethiopia rejects, but Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt insist on. And the 1929 treaty between Britain and Egypt, which also gives uh, Britain and Egypt, Egypt and Sudan, and Egypt as, as a successor, uh, the right to V2 projects in, the, in, the, in, the, in uh, the White Nile countries, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. And those countries have, uh, have mentioned that they have denounced the treaty and they are no longer bound, bound, bound by it. So those treaties, really <clears throat> the base of the dispute and the conflict. And then we have the 1959 Nile Waters Treaty. It is a bilateral treaty between Sudan and Egypt. Uh, none of the countries, uh, other countries of the Nile are party to this. And the title of the treaty is fully, uh, the, the agreement for the full utilization of the Nile waters. And that is the cause of concern of the other countries that the Sudan and Egypt have put their hands on the entire Nile waters when they talk about full utilization, which they did because they did, the Sudan and Egypt divided the entire Nile flow between Egypt and Sudan. And although they recognize other Nile states' rights, and, but they require approval of Egypt to Sudan for any allocation to those countries. Uh, that's the 1959 agreement. Next. Uh, we'll talk now about the Nile Basin Initiative and the Cooperative Framework Agreement, what, what's also called the NTB Agreement. Next. Uh, the, the Nile Basin Initiative was born officially in, uh, in February 20, uh, 22nd in 1999 in Dar es Salaam. The Minister of Water Resources signed the vision, which is to achieve sustainable socioeconomic development through equitable utilization of and benefit from the common Nile water resources. And it, it, it recognized the rights of all the states on the Nile. The main task was to prepare an inclusive treaty for the 11, uh, at that time, 10 riparian countries. Next. Uh, this is the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the institutional setup of the Nile Basin Initiative, the Nile Council of Ministers. We have uh, that is the main body, the, the highest body, and then the Nile Technical Advisory Committee below it, and then the Nile Basin Initiative Secretariat, which is based in Entebbe. Next, uh, we have two. In addition to this, we have 
to offices, uh, the Eastern Nile uh, uh, Technical Regional Office in Addis Ababa for the Eastern Nile, and then the Nile Basin at uh, the Southern Nile uh, Office in Kigali, uh, in, in Kigali, Rwanda. As I mentioned, the negotiation started in 1999 for the uh, uh, Cooperative Framework Agreement, we call it CFA, facilitated by the World Bank, UNDP, and other donors. The CFA was drafted and it's based largely on the UN Water Course Convention. I'm happy that the, some of the drafters were the ones who really drafted the UN Convention. However, the negotiations deadlocked in 2009, 10 years over three main issues. Water security, uh, that's Article 14. Uh, Egypt and Sudan insisted on that water security means the existing uses and rights. Uh, basically, the 1902, 1929, 1959 agreement. And where are the other countries? And this is basically I'm talking about the obligation not to cause harm, existing uses and existing rights. And uh, whereas the other countries were talking about equitable utilization. And then there is also issue of pre, -pre notification uh, on projects and planned measures. There were major differences on those two issues, and the negotiations broke down. Uh, next. Uh, six countries signed the CFA, the Cooperative Framework Agreement 2020 and 2010, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, and Burundi. It's vehemently opposed by Egypt and Sudan because it does not, in their view, recognize their existing uses and rights. Thus far, it's ratified by four countries, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda. South Sudan it became independent in 2011. It declared its support for the CFA, but has not taken any action. Democratic Republic of Congo is undecided. The CFA needs ratification of six countries. So far, it has four countries, so it has not yet entered into force. Next. Next. Uh, this is the, uh, the Nile Basin position. The uh, Burundi, Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda have signed it. Again, it's Sudan and Egypt, undecided Congo, and ratified by the four countries, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda. Next. This is the signing of the CFA in May 2010. It was, it was a big thing in, 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 in Kenya, in Nairobi, Kenya. Next. Uh, then now we, we come to the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. And uh, just before, before talking about the GERD, we need to mention that this is not the first dam in Ethiopia. There are earlier dams. I mentioned Fincha, Tane Belis, and Tekezi. Tekezi is, is the largest. It's on the Adbara River. The announcement about the GERD was made in late March and the construction started in April, in April 2011, March 2011 and April 2011. At that time, Egypt was busy with the January 2011 revolution. Uh, uh, the GERD lies 15 kilometers from the Sudanese borders. And this is one major issue for Sudan now. It's 170 meters in height, so supported by a saddle dam. The lake capacity is 74 billion cubic meters of water. Uh, this compared to the uh, Swan High Dam of 162 billion cubic meters of water, uh, it's about less than half. It's the largest dam in Africa and the 10th largest in the world. Next. Uh, the purpose is to generate 6,000 megawatts of electricity. It has 16 turbines, each with uh, 375 megawatts. Construction is being done by Salini Company of Italy. The Chinese are building the transmission lines. They're not involved directly in the, in the, in the uh, GERD, but in the transmission line. The Europeans are providing mechanical equipment. The cost estimates are about $5 billion. And the funding is coming from Ethiopia's own resources and bonds issued to Ethiopians. There is no, there is no foreign uh, investment or foreign financing for the GERD. Next. The concerns of Egypt and Sudan. Egypt, was, is, con Egypt is concerned about the effects of uh, reduction in water flow for irrigation, for power generation, and for storage at Swan High Dam. Those are the three main uh, concerns for Egypt. And the, but the other concern is about the period in which the lake is to be filled. We mentioned 74 billion cubic meters. So if the shorter the period, the more, the more, the more problems for Egypt. Sudan acknowledges major benefits for the pro project. Regulation of the water flow, uh, 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 floods will no longer be a challenge to Sudan. The uh, navigation will be around the year. The Sudan will be able to, uh, because of the regulation of the flow, will be able to have two to three crop rotations a year. And uh, the replenishment uh, of the groundwater will be throughout the year. We are, where is, can we get to the slides where we were? 
Sorry about that. No, it's okay. Are we there? Uh, Are we there? More, one more, one more, one, two more, more, one, one more, uh, one more. Just, uh, I think we're, we're here. We, just if you could go back to the previous one, if you can, if you can. Uh, I said Sudan acknowledged major benefits and I mentioned some of them. There are concerns. Uh, one of them is the safety of the dam. It's only 15 kilometers from the border with Sudan. And then there, the, the Sudan talks about the risks to restore his dam. So Seris dam is about 100 kilometers from the Gert. It's a small dam of about 7 billion cubic meters. It's about 10, one tenth of the Gert. So there is a major concern in Sudan that if there is no coordination between the water flow from the Gerd into Sudan, the Rosaris Dam could just be inundated. And then, of course, there is the concern about the period in which lake is, the, the, the Gerd lakes to be filled. Next. Uh, this is the, uh, this is, you could see the uh, location of the Grand Sudan Renaissance Dam and then the, the border from Sudan and then the Rosaris Dam. Uh, this is within, within so the, between Sudan and, Ethi and Ethiopia. Next. Uh, negotiations uh, passed since 2011. Uh, the, it immediately after the announcement, uh, the, there was fear of, fear of uh, uh, diplomacy between the three countries, and there were a lot of uh, announcements uh, from both sides and uh, very, very, very high, high intention. But then gradually things started settling down, and the three parties agreed to establish a panel, international panel of experts consisting from 10. Uh, experts, two from each country and four from outside the Nile Basin. And the panel uh, studied the project and came out with the report. I will show you the report in a minute. Uh, it's called the Report of the International Panel of Experts. It has uh, looked at the studies and the, the, the concluded that some of the studies need to be done in more in depth, particularly two studies on the downstream effects and the hydrology. That resulted uh, that the past took them, to, uh, the report came out in 2013, negotiations continued, and the major breakthrough happened in 2015. That is the, uh, the signing of the agreement on declaration of principles signed by three parties. Uh, we'll see in a minute the level of uh, at which is signed. This is a major, a major agreement, and in my view, a, a break, a break, major breakthrough. Uh, we'll talk about it in a minute. And then that was followed by Another document that was signed by the Ministers of Water Resources and Minister of Foreign Affairs called the Khartoum document. It was concluded in December 2015. And uh, uh, they, they went on saying, uh, uh, agreeing that the two studies would be done by consultants, international consultants. And the, there was agreement initially on two firms, Artelia and Delta Ris. Then Delta Ris uh, was replaced by BRI. And then they hired the law firm. And then that didn't work. And then we started again direct negotiations with six ministers, ministers of water resources and ministers of foreign affairs. And then they established a committee called the National Independent Scientific Research Group, NISRG, which continued the, the, the negotiation. And in 2018, there was major deadlock that led to the involvement of the USA and the World Bank. A series of meetings were held in Washington brokered by the USA and the World Bank, but that didn't work. Uh, and then uh, Egypt uh, resorted to the Security Council. And this is really uh, um, uh, a history-making event. This is the fairest dispute ever to go to the Security Council. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, fairest international water dispute ever to go to the Security Council, not, not quite all disputes go to the Security Council. Uh, and in that, in, that, in that shape, Egypt sent a major memorandum uh, Ethiopia replied to the memorandum by a, long, by a lengthier one. Sudan replied by um, another memorandum. Egypt sent a, th a second memorandum. Ethiopia replied. Sudan replied. And then a seventh memorandum came from Ethiopia. Those memorandum, I think, together would probably come to a close to 800 pages. As I said, it's a major, a major, a major event. We can talk about it in the question and answer session. But the Security Council wasn't really interested in, in, in getting involved. I mean, they talked and discussed it, and they were quite happy that the African Union uh, uh, decided to intervene. So they just left it to the African Union, and the African Union is still leading the uh, mediating the negotiations. But we'll see the number of uh, number of issues that's still pending. Next, Salman, I think we are we are a little bit over time. If you can just conclude, please. Okay. 
Okay, I'll conclude. This is an international. This is the international panel of experts report. Next, I think I'm I'm getting there. Uh, I mean, it's just uh, the uh, the uh, the agreement on the the the, the on the uh, the uh, uh, declaration of principles consists of uh, major points: the uh, principles of development, regional integration, sustainability, cooperation, and then cooperation on, on management of the grid. And those two points will be taken, I'm sure, by Kevin and and Rawia to agree on rules for filling for first filling of the reservoir and to agree on rules for annual operation of the grid. Those are the two issues that are now still pending. Priority for electricity sale to Egypt and Sudan, and then there is the principle of dam safety, which is one of the issues that Sudan is concerned about now. Next. This is the signing of the agreement in Khartoum uh, on March 23rd, 2015. Next. We see the three presidents, uh, the three heads of uh, the heads of the states, uh, President Sisi, President Al Bashir, and Prime Minister Haile Mariam. Next, uh, this is the photo of the three of them. I, I, one would have hoped that this would continue, that spirit would continue. Next, uh, I'm getting to conclusion. Ayman, uh, Nile is a river of limited flow, as I mentioned, 84 to 109 billion cubic meters, resulting in increasing competition over its water, water resources. And cooperation is hampered by a number of factors. The colonial treaties are resultant upper and upper hand of Egypt and Sudan over Nile waters, existing using uses and obligation not to cause harm versus equitable and reasonable utilization, the, the two major issues for the upper riparian and lower riparian. And then, as I mentioned, uh, that resulted in unilateral development plans, mainly dams. And treaties here are real causes of disputes, not source of cooperation. We look at treaties for any, uh, any river, and we see that they are the base for cooperation. Here, there are cause for dispute. And, and, and the, the, there is, in my view, a power shift in the Nile, as shown by the CFA and a signature by six countries and, 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 and a ratification by four countries. Next, and this is the last slide, Simon. Uh, there are large areas of possible cooperation. Ethiopia hydropower in the Nile alone, more than 30,000 30, 30, megawatt of electricity. Sudan irrigable lands, by some accounts, uh, close to 22 uh, million hectares. Uh, sorry, acres. Lake Victoria, source of major fisheries. South Sudan is a huge uh, area for livestock and Egypt industrial capabilities. I think those five factors, in my view, five five uh, areas of cooperation are, are really possible areas for cooperation. Uh, and in my view, also the CFA differences are resolvable with good will and cooperation. And one major point I use, I, I make always, I always make, and and Rawia. Maybe may, may be able to talk more about it. Gear should have been a jointly owned and operated project. We have Itaipu between Brazil and Paraguay. We have Manantari then between Senegal, Mauritania, Guinea, and Mali. And we have even the Nile Basin, the Rusumu project in the Kagera River between Rwanda, Burundi, and Tanzania. So we have deep roots of conflicts, and we have, but we have large areas of cooperation. Where, which way are we heading? I would leave that to the uh, to the uh, audience and. After, after thinking about what I have said and putting it in their own account of what they understand of the mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salman. I think I uh, appreciate your, uh, your presentation and uh, uh, the very important information you have given. And uh, yes, indeed, we uh, exceeded the time allocated. Uh, uh, and of course, I just uh, wanted to make sure that we are all buying with, with that time. And uh, without just further, uh, I'd like to introduce the second speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Ariel uh, Dinar. Um, uh, uh, Simon, are you still talking? Uh, yes, I am. I'm okay. just uh, <clears throat> sorry. What I was just saying and, and introducing Ariel. Ariel is a distinguished professor of environmental economics and policy uh, of the School of Public uh, Policy, the University of California, Riverside. He's also an advisory member of the Rosenberg Forum, and he will be addressing uh, uh, the, the grid. Uh, should that be a reason for cooperation or source of conflict? So Ariel, the floor is yours. And just reminding also that uh, keeping on the time and of course, I think you will be mentioning that you are going to place some sort of bull, bulls after uh, or during your presentation, Ariel. Yeah. So, floor is yours. So in light of uh, cooperation, I will try to make up for some of the time that uh, uh, we lost. So uh, <clears throat> I will 
build up on uh, Salman's presentation and uh, we'll add a little bit to the points that he made uh, in terms of uh, what is going on in the basin. So this is the basin, uh, a different map. We have 15% coming from the uh, White Nile and other tributaries of the Nile and 85% uh, of the flow coming from the Blue Nile, which is a very major uh, source of Nile water. And then this is uh, the entire uh, <clears throat> the entire basin. Uh, this region is a region that has uh, that shows a major unrest in terms of both domestic and regional uh, politics. And this is, in my opinion, also one of the difficulties to uh, come up with some. Uh, one vision for the uh, for the management of the Nile water. So there is uh, uh, a question here: How many riparian states share the Nile, both blue and white? And uh, any of you who wants to answer is uh, invited. Major uh, events in the good, the majority is uh, correct. Uh, starting in 1882, where Great Britain uh, colonialized Egypt and Sudan, this is the beginning uh, of the, let's call it the modern area of, not modern, but the recent area, uh, era of uh, 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 exchanges and uh, conflicts on the Nile water. Uh, in the next slides, I show also uh, some of the more detailed uh, events, including some that have been uh, mentioned by Salman that uh, <coughs> show that uh, both in terms of uh, in interests of the different uh, uh, states in the basin and in terms of the uh, local uh, politics or domestic politics. This was, uh, this is a big problem in the basin that has to be overcome. Uh, I just want to mention two additional uh, events, actually not events, but processes. Uh, the Teco Nile and Nile 2002, which was again uh, a process uh, of regional consultation that was supposed to lead to uh, some fruitful uh, results. And of course, what uh, was mentioned by Salman, the Nile Basin Initiative, uh, these are just two additional examples for the ongoing and endless consultation in the basin between the states trying to bridge between uh, opposed interests and uh, unilateral uh, plans to develop the basin. So again, what are the uh, important positions on the, the, the Nile? And when I say Nile, I mean the Blue Nile because this is the focus of my talk. So physically Ethiopia or the land in Ethiopia supplies more than 85% of the water that flows into the Nile River. This gives Ethiopia, of course, the, uh, uh, oh, oh, makes Ethiopia arguing that it has the right to utilize the natural resources that initiate on their own land. Egypt, on the other hand, depends almost entirely on the Nile waters. So if Egypt will not get water from the Nile, Egypt cannot exist. And this was again, the position of Egypt all the time. And Egypt sees the dam as a major threat to the water security, to its water security, because it can regulate the water in such a way that it will not uh, provide water for the as high Aswan dam and also will uh, truncate 
flows of water to Egypt. So both states, Ethiopia and Egypt, use some of the concepts from the international law that are orthogonal to each other. Ethiopia argues for absolute territorial sovereignty, and Egypt argues for absolute territorial integrity. And uh, this is hard to bridge uh, uh, over the years. And uh, what we have seen is that all the discussions and negotiations uh, are about that uh, orthogonal uh, claims that came from Egypt and Ethiopia, who are the major uh, opponents uh, on that conflict. Uh, and Sudan was as well, uh, but the major uh, are Sudan and Ethiopia. So over the years, until uh, 2011, uh, Egypt was uh, able, using its diplomatic capacity and uh, the existing agreements, the two 1929 and 1959 agreement that were uh, bilateral agreements between Egypt and Sudan, to successfully prevent the construction uh, of any major infrastructure in, uh, on, in the land of, of uh, Ethiopia. And for those years until 2011, the role was that Ethiopia was on, always the, the, the party that complained to the international uh, institutions. Uh, in 2011, uh, following some unrest in Egypt, uh, Ethiopia was able to, uh, 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 after not being able to do it, uh, was able to uh, raise funds from both domestically uh, and bonds that were issued uh, to the diaspora. Uh, many Ethiopians uh, outside of uh, Ethiopia contributed and bought these bonds. And the role between Egypt and Ethiopia changed now. And Ethiopia is now <clears throat> uh, uh, showed uh, facts on the ground and the, uh, the GER, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is a fact and a new fact and a new reality in the region. So the question is, what is next? And here is what, uh, we suggested uh, in some work that we did uh, that was published also. So a different approach is needed and this approach uh, that everyone is talking about uh, is needed. And this approach calls for cooperation. And the point is not just to use the word cooperation, but to show uh, economically that cooperation will be attractive to all the parties in the basin. And again, I am talking mainly about the Blue Nile. Oh, one moment. So, no, I'm sorry that, uh, please fill the questionnaire so I can see the text behind it because otherwise I cannot see the, the text. So, uh, so the question is, what, what could these uh, countries in the basin do in order to uh, take into account the existing GERD? The GERD is now a reality, and the question is whether or not some of the benefits uh, that the GERD produces can be utilized and uh, realized by the different states in the basin. So uh, putting again, putting politics aside, which is probably going to be very difficult uh, in the region uh, uh, because of some long history of uh, protracted uh, conflict, uh, if just politics can be put aside <clears throat> and focus can be put on the potential benefits, uh, Let me try to, oh, thank you. Uh, moving from, okay, so just to answer the long-term 
mean flow is 98 billion cubic meters. So this is the answer. Uh, putting politics aside may be hard, but moving to a concept of benefit sharing rather than water sharing. So water sharing is the, uh, the basis for the claims and arguments by the uh, states, or the major one. Uh, and agreeing on a mechanism to share the joint incremental benefits, which is not, not easy, but this might be a, one of the solutions to the region. So keeping also in mind what is around the corner, if not already there, the consequences of climate change and population growth that were mentioned also by Salman. Uh, so taking all of that into account, what I will try to do is to introduce a principle of water rights, allocate and trade. And as long as we agree, or the countries in the basin agree that uh, water rights, as long as uh, whatever they were uh, allocated to the countries, whatever treaty is the one to be the basis for the water rights, uh, but as long as they can treat, trade the water rights and then exchange benefits, uh, this could be uh, with some trust building between the states in the basin could be relevant and acceptable to all. So what, we, what I'm going to present in the next two or three slides is the following. Uh, first of all, the different water right uh, scenarios that have been discussed in the past, then uh, developing an economic model for the basin that can uh, assess the benefits, the overall benefits with and without water trade between the countries, and with and without the GERT, uh, the, the, the dam. I will introduce uh, the concept of social planner, and this is a supra basin uh, authority that looks at the benefits of the entire basin without taking into account political boundaries and the different interests of the country, just the entire basin, and leaving the allocation of those benefits to a second, second stage. We will also talk about unilateral developments rather than joint developments of the uh, benefits from the water in the basin. So first of all, uh, the water rights, uh, uh, WRA, as I will call them, uh, there are about five uh, publications, and I just used here three, that came up with some suggestions how to allocate both the share and the uh, long-term flow between the different Blue Nile uh, states, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt. Uh, one is the uh, suggested WRA1 that was <clears throat> suggested by Dale Whittington in their 1995 publication. Another uh, WRA or another allocation of rights is by the United Nations 1997 uh, international water uh, law, Article 5, uh, and we based it on the 1960 population because it talks about needs. And then WR3 based on Beaumont uh, publication. So these are some, there are two more, but just for the interest of time, I will not talk about them. So we developed uh, a model, a regional model, of all the economies of the states of uh, Egypt, Ethiopia, and uh, Sudan. And uh, we used <coughs> several parameters that were of interest to us. Uh, first of all, without GERD, and then with GERD. And then for each of these two major uh, scenarios, without trade and with trade. Trade, of course, of water. I'm not talking about trade uh, of uh, goods. Uh, so we have here four combinations 
of uh, scenarios. And for each of the rotor right allocations, WRAs, we calculated uh, based on reasonable assumptions that can be changed if somebody does not accept them. Uh, the economic benefits to the entire basin that have now uh, to be allocated between the different states in terms of uh, uh, an allocation scheme that will be agreeable to all of them. Uh, the percentage of the best allocation, which is defined as the social planner allocation. Uh, and we can see that there are differences uh, with preferences to the GERD and the trade. So the green line is the line or the column that produces the highest uh, or the most preferred outcomes, uh, which is the GERD and with trade of water rights. So just to save on time, I will skip the rest of the uh, slide and move to the next slide. So this is, you know, what I would like to uh, you to take home is that uh, there is a zone of agreement between, if we look at the, uh, put again, politics aside and look at the, uh, uh, at the economic benefits, there is a zone of agreement that all the three states can share. It is indeed small, as you can see. This is a zone of agreement. It is small, and there is a solution, at least uh, a, an economic solution. The trick is how to make that uh, area, small area, how to extend it. And I think that technically speaking, all the countries in the basin can do that. And what I will do in probably the next slide is to add one more aspect that have not been uh, discussed uh, so far, which I think is one of the most important obstacles uh, for uh, uh, an agreement on the Nile. And this is the issue of source degradation in the Nile water. Uh, and I, I claim that uh, the resource degradation is much more uh, severe in the basin than water scarcity. And what we see on the, in the picture here is uh, the muddy water of the Nile uh, that are the result of soil erosion that uh, comes from the uh, highland, uh, Ethiopian highland, closed canals and uh, reservoirs in downstream countries. So- Ariel, you are one again, minute over, Ariel. Really? Okay. Yes. So I will, I will conclude. I will go to the next. What I wanted to say is that following this is my last slide. The feature to promote future regional cooperation in the Nile Basin is that it seems that the cooperation has potential attractiveness. Some fresh thinking is needed in order to uh, bring it to the uh, negotiation table. We need to be able to expand the cake or to increase that zone of agreement where all the states uh, have an interest such as water, electricity, flood control, and soil erosion. There is also a possibility to link issues, which is a tactic in order to uh, get out of a gridlock where the riparian states are inversely related in, with their interest, such as water allocation, and trade agreements, regular trade agreements of goods and energy transactions between the states. This could be uh, the, and then benefit sharing rather than uh, water sharing that again need some trust building between the country. So with that, I will stop here because I made a promise to save time and I didn't, uh, didn't uh, was not able to make my, 
for all this. Thank you very much, Ariel. I think uh, that's uh, that's absolutely fine. I mean, uh, we're trying to be also as much flexible as possible, but for the time sake and just also uh, understanding that uh, some people might have other obligations too. So uh, I'd like also uh, to move uh, immediately to the third speaker, uh, Dr. Kevin Wheeler. Uh, he's an Oxford Martin Fellow at the Environmental Change Institute of the University of Oxford. Uh, Dr. Wheeler, uh, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and the floor is yours. I'd just like to remind again for the time and to sticking on um, to the time so that we also have the other speakers speak and uh, the rest of participants attending till the end. Dr. Wheeler. Dr. Wheeler, we're seeing your shared, um, there you go. Perfect. Dr. Willie, you're muted. Well, that's that, that probably works better if I turn off the mute. Um, uh, it's an honor to have an opportunity to speak uh, to speak with this distinguished panel, and I will try to get through in my in my in my time. I know we're a little bit behind, um, but the talk is called "Understanding and Managing New Risks on the Nile with the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam." And we'll see. Part of this is based on a, a paper that we did um, uh, published recently. Um, and that included with uh, Dr. Uh, Eva Zagona, Dale Whittington, Mark Julin, and, and Jim Hall, and also we're very frequently with um, uh, Jamal Abdo at the University of Khartoum, as well as Mohammed Bashir in Manchester, and many other people um, on these on these issues. So don't need to go through this very um, very extensively, obviously, but um, we know the, the the sources of the of the Nile, with Lake Victoria and Lake Tana, uh, the the um, the uh, uh, the Victoria Albert Nile flowing into the Sud wetland, White Nile, and the Blue Nile, and then, the, then flowing northward into the uh, uh, up into the, into the Mediterranean through um, uh, through the High Aswan Dam. Okay, here's the the location of the dam, uh, just upstream of the um, of the border. So the dam itself. Um, uh, is located um, just upstream of the border with an annual flow of about 49 billion cubic meters. Uh, with a storage of about 74 billion cubic meters. Um, the active storage on that is about 59 billion cubic meters. So it can store actively um, a, uh, manage about 1.2 times the average annual flow um, within, the, uh, within the active zone of the, of the reservoir. The dam itself, for some of the engineers out there, um, there's a, the main dam is about uh, is 155 meter uh, high dam. Saddle dam is about a 50 meter uh, high dam, a low head dam. Uh, but very long, about 5.2 kilometers in length to be able to, to uh, allow the storage uh, for the full volume. Now, why, why, or what's the justification for the dam? Um, we'll do a few plots here. So the, uh, the energy consumption per capita, if you looked at all of the Nile Basin countries, uh, you'll see one country stands far and away more, and that's Egypt on the top. Um, if you were to look at just these lower countries here, we would see uh, they're all fairly, fairly similar, but a couple of them are shooting up uh, rapidly, Sudan and Ethiopia. So uh, a, a growth rate in terms of power consumption. In terms of access to electricity, uh, we can see here's the, all the, the three different countries, their percent access to electricity. Egypt sits with about 100% access. It's not always perfect electricity, um, but at least there's good access in most of the country, pretty much all of the country, um, rural and urban. Um, Sudan, about a 60% access to electricity, and Ethiopia, around a 40% access to electricity as of 2018. The vast majority of uh, electricity sources for Ethiopia comes from hydropower, pretty much all of it. Where Egypt, you can see the vast majority of it in the yellow comes from natural gas. Uh, and today, only a very small portion of the, of the water, of the, the energy comes from, um, from electricity. And Sudan, uh, most of it comes from hydropower as well right now. So driving this is the economic growth in the, in the countries. And we can see uh, the, the continued growth pattern uh, per capita of all three countries. But we, all, but we particularly note the GDP growth uh, and percentage of Ethiopia um, around 2000, since the 2000s or so uh, stayed pretty consistent um, uh, 5 to 10% uh, um, growth per capita. Um, so showing just incredible, gro uh, incredible growth in, uh, in that country and driving a lot of this, um, these projects. 
So how significant will this dam be? Um, what is 15? So, so here is the energy uh, generation or Ethiopian energy uh, production um, is the dark, the dark black line up through 2018. And the, the GERD will add on about 15 terawatt hours uh, per year of energy generation. So roughly doubling the total energy generation within, uh, within the country. Um, um, incredible, incredible step change in terms of what's what's available, and the challenge, of course, is the distribution lines. Uh, whether they can get that that electricity distributed to, to such a uh, a wide population, diffuse population. And we can see there's a gap in between the total consumption, total production. So a lot of the energy is also planned to be sold to the neighboring countries, Sudan, Djibouti, and Kenya, uh, and there is ex existing power lines in place as well as planned power lines in place. Uh, right now, so part of it will be uh, uh, through the power sales, um, particularly to uh, to these three countries and into the East African power pool as well. So, some quick overview of the hydrologic trends uh, in the basin, um, just so we have a good understanding. Um, the thickness of the lines uh, in this in this well-known plot by Blackmore Whittington uh, represents the the uh, the total flows in the different areas. And we can see that about 30% of the flows come from the White Nile that come flow into Egypt. 57%, as Dr. Salman said, uh, uh, roughly come down the Blue Nile. About 13% come down the Abara River um, for the total flow into Lake Nasser. And about 53% of that comes above the GERD. So oftentimes people say the, how the GERD controlled the Nile. Well, it, it can control a portion of it, but not all of it. There's a lot of tributaries that it, that it cannot control. So yeah, about 53%. So uh, how does how is the hydrology looked over time? Well, if you look at the at the dam site at the near the GERD, the, uh, near the Rosaris Dam or the LDM gauge, it's been very consistent actually. Maybe a slight increase through time with some large periods of high flows and large periods of low flows, but no particular um, uh, strong trend in terms of uh, wetting or drying. The naturalized flow, if you were to to remove all the dams and you were to to uh, correct for all of the consumption upstream. Um, at the Aswan Dam, projection is more or less it's increasing a little bit, so a little bit more water over time. Um, not not tremendously, but uh, but but certainly uh, appears to be an increasing trend. However, the actual flows um, uh, uh, at Dongola, just upstream of the of the Sudanese Egyptian border, does show a downward trend, and, and that's driven primarily by consumption um, within Sudan. Uh, so that's the only only significant um, effect upstream currently is the, uh, the the water use within Sudan. So our, the paper that I'll refer to um, uh, frames uh, a sort of a new framing of the forthcoming risks. And we really break it into three eras. The first era, the filling of the GERD period. The second era, what we'll call a new normal um, after the filling is complete. And the third, a multi-year drought. What would happen um, once, uh, once a large drought like the 1980s would occur again? So the first, the first question here, filling the GERD. So to get a good idea of the of the the, the engineering of the GERD and the process, uh, this is a, a, a profile, um, not necessarily the scale of the GERD, but um, it will show you in the first year, uh, which happened in 2021 or 2020 last summer, uh, 4.9 billion cubic meters were filled, and that's about 9% of the of the average annual flow at this at the GERD site, or about 5% of the natural flow in, into into Egypt. The second year, which is coming up this year. Uh, they intend to capture 13.5 billion cubic meters. And then after that, years three, four, five, add, would add another 30.9 billion cubic meters to get up to a level of 625 meters for the annual operation. And after that, they would operate in this flood zone every year. That's sort of their, their, their described plan right now. So we're about to start year number two, or later on this summer, of the filling process. Of course, with a lot of dispute on that. The High Aswan Dam, um, this is a quick profile of it, and it's very full right now. We're, we're near the top, and we'll, we'll show a plot next um, that demonstrates this. But what they have is, is a, a drought management plan. So as the, as the reservoir level falls, they start reducing their usage, uh, their releases down into Egypt from the High Aswan Dam. So here's a, um, here's a demonstration of the storage level since 1992, um, uh, and we can see how full the Aswan Dam is currently, and we can see how they've been keeping the reservoirs high. Um, they haven't been going down. This is their maximum elevation and their minimum elevation. Below that, um, this level of 147 meters, there would be a very abrupt and un unplanned reduction. So they want to stay away from this level at all costs. Now, 
they would normally have this flood operation space. And we can see they've been trying to maintain the reservoir high, really in anticipation of the GERD is the likely reason, but through a lot of water conservation efforts. Now, if it falls below 60 billion cubic meters, they start reducing their releases down into Egypt by 5%, and then by 10%, if it's below 55, and then if it's below 50 billion cubic meters, by 15%. So that's their drought management policy. And the question is really how low will the Aswan Dam fall? We know that it'll fall to a certain extent, but the question is how low will it fall during the filling period? So here's the, the historical storage of the Aswan Dam, a little bit of a wider range. And if we, if we simulate all of the different possible, all, all the different hydrologies of the past, we can get kind of a distribution of how low it will possibly go. And we can see with this distribution, if, if, if every year is equally probable, we can, a few conclusions. The Aswan Dam will certainly fall to lower levels that hasn't been seen in recent years. Fortunately, we're in the second year and it's already still very full, so we're hoping it's going to stay full throughout and we'll have some, some wet years. But it's likely the reservoir will fall. However, the most likely case is the reservoir will not fall low enough to get below the these shortage levels. So most likely no shortages would be required in Egypt as a result of the filling of the dam. However, Egypt might invoke some possible precautionary measures to try to avoid any, any risk of, of critical shortages falling down below this, this, this thick red line here, um, because that would, that would be detrimental. Uh, so they may, they may opt to reduce, reduce some of the releases to be precautionary. There's a low possibility, but there always is one, that the, that the Aswan Dam would fall to critical levels where there would be large shortages. Now, the risks to filling are uh, really currently fall in Sudan. So what are those risks and what are the nature of those risks? So, uh, so Sudan has the small reservoir Rosari, small in comparison uh, to the GERD, that sits immediately downstream of the GERD reservoir. So we can see that it's about 5.8 billion cubic meters is the storage of that reservoir. Um, uh, and so as the GERD reservoir filled up in uh, their first 4.9 billion cubic meters, that, it would, that number was, was just a little bit larger than the entire storage of the, of the Rosaris reservoir. So the result of that was there was a temporary stop of flows during the filling period. Um, the fill, that filling period of that first part, portion took about a week or so, um, more or less a week or so to, to fill up that first part of it. Um, and that caused a lot of reaction within Sudan uh, and what the, uh, uh, what the potential risks were, because obviously they, they would not be able to hold on to the, to the storage um, in that reservoir if it were full to start with. Usually it's, it's fairly empty by the time the, uh, um, the beginning of the rainy season starts. Um, so very critical time for Sudan to, uh, to work together with Ethiopia. So the second year of the filling, well, it, it did refill, of course, during the, during the wet season. So then during the second period of the fill, when, Eth when Ethiopia wishes to catch another, capture another 13.5 billion cubic meters. Now that, that's obviously um, more than double the volume of the Sudanese reservoir downstream. Uh, so there could a, a very significant um, chance if there were no um, uh, mitigating operations that it would have an impact on, on Sudan during this period. However, they have low river diversion outlets, bottom outlets, and turbines that, that the GERD or the Ethiopia could be using to make releases downstream. And that, of course, strategic coordinator releases to try to um, work with Sudan to make sure that their needs are met during this filling period it will be a very, very critical um, um, requirement uh, to avoid any harm in Sudan. So in 2022, they'll add another 10.5 billion cubic meters as sort of the, the Ethiopia's primary plan. 2023, another 10.4 billion cubic meters. In 2024, fill it up to the to the, the top of their um, uh, of the regular operation level. So throughout this period, there'll certainly be a need to manage in st strategic coordinator releases to make sure there's not negative impacts within Sudan um, for sure during this time. And then it'll oscillate after that up at the very top. Uh, but however, through all this time, there's a very significant um, challenge and really highlights the importance of coordination, as was mentioned before. If large flows are released and Sudan is not prepared for those flows, Sudanese reservoirs do stand a significant risk of being overtopped. So that's a very, very important reason for Ethiopia and Sudan to cooperate 
and to communicate on a technical level about how much water is being released at all times so Sudan knows and can prepare for what releases should be coming down. It is incredibly important for safety reasons uh, for the Rosaris Dam uh, that this coordination take place. So in the second era, we'll call the new normal condition after the GERD is filled and no substantial new developments or withdrawals have occurred. What we see under this new normal, a, a, a new normal situation. So if the Aswan Dam is in the black and the GERD is in the blue, this is the storage levels. The dotted line is, is, would be before the GERD existed and the, and the solid line is afterwards. And we can see there's actually not too much of a change uh, because the GERD is really a non-consumptive reservoir other than some evaporation. Um, so under average hydrologic conditions, we would see that the Aswan Dam would probably recover. Um, the, it'll, it'll likely recover, but it'll likely operate at somewhat of a lower level. The inflows to the Aswan Dam would be more predictable than they have before because of the, the operation of the GERD. The extremes would be buffered um, uh, coming into the Aswan Dam. So it'd be slightly lower in some areas, slightly higher in other areas. During this new normal time, really there's a fairly minimal risk to Egypt as long as there's not a, a large additional consumption upstream. Um, really this new normal would be, a, would be a, a fairly minimal risk to Egypt and require minimal cooperation. So, um, during, so essentially during this new normal period, this, this era two, the outflows would essentially reach uh, be equal to the inflows, except for evaporation losses um, over the long run. Uh, the minimal coordination would be needed, and good, but however, good data exchange will still be extremely important. You will see significant benefits for Ethiopia and Sudan and really a minimal risk to Egypt during this new normal. However, the risk is becoming complacent um, and it would be very, very uh, um, unfortunate if, um, uh, if there was not an agreement before a multi-year drought would strike. We'll see why. So under a typical drought, what, what, what might we expect? Well, typically there's going into a drought, a period during a drought, and then exiting a drought, sort of three different stages, um, uh, sort of demonstrated by the timeline here. So what would happen if the 1980s drought occurred without the GERD? The 1980s was obviously a very critical time um, in the Horn of Africa um, and had a significant effect. So what we do is we simulate what would happen right now, even, if, even without the GERD. This is the storage level of the Aswan Dam. And, so, and, and this is the critical storage level down at the bottom, we another 147 meters where the turbines would shut down, they couldn't get enough, uh, enough um, uh, uh, releases out, out from the dam to, to supply Egypt. Even without the, without the GERD, we would see the levels of the Aswan Dam get very low if that drought reoccurred. That just happened in the 1980s. There's our period before, our drought onset period. There's our drought recovery period afterwards. It actually didn't stay down for very long and went back up again. But we know that the Aswan Dam would fall below all of those three management policy trigger lines, causing shortages. So this represents the amount of shortage to Egypt in billion cubic meters. So 55.5 55 billion cubic meters is how much um, uh, Egypt strives to, to, to withdraw from the river um, is their perceived allocation. Um, and it would result in shortages based on their own policies of six to eight billion cubic meters in several years. That would be, that's what happens without the grid in place. The Aswan Dam would reach, would reach this uh, near this critical level now, however, if the, if the GERD were upstream and had water available in it, and it released a continuous energy generation, what we would see is the, the, uh, the black line here, and it would actually mitigate some of the effects in the beginning. What we would see is, is lower shortages during the first part, and it would shift to shortages during the, greater shortages during the, um, during the, uh, the exit of the drought or during the, the, um, uh, the recovery portion of the drought. So we can see there'd be uh, 15 billion cubic meters um, uh, less of shortages during that initial part and additional 7 billion cubic meters of shortages to Egypt after that part. So essentially shifts that down. So this is actually a fairly good situation for Egypt uh, when there's extra water upstream to be able to, to release that water. Um, however, we can really focus on this recovery period and get an idea, get a feeling of how difficult this will be. Both, both reservoirs are in very low situations and both reservoirs have to recover. Kevin, so I know actually, that, I, 
Kevin, I think we are we are over time as well. So just uh, if possible. Okay. Okay. I'll finish here for now. So um, so we can see the GERD would actually fall down to the bottom along this, and it would be very difficult to recover. It would be uh, this is un un unstable situation for Ethiopia. So this drought recovery period, both countries will want to recover as soon as possible. They have to prioritize what order should the reservoirs be refilled, which are the most critical needs, whether it's domestic or power generation. And then we, we can really think what constitutes coordination. This is our final slides here. So we think of this continuum of cooperation. First is just a basic data exchange, perhaps a filling agreement, shared operating plans, and then sharing possible critical situations like drought, drought operation planning or flood operation planning, moving farther along a continuum of cooperation. Then finally, releases to, for sort of an idealized situation, which, um, um, as, as Dr. Dunar was saying, if you're able to do economic optimization, uh, but that takes a lot more coordination than where they're currently at now, right now. So moving along this continuum, step by step, incremental. So the summary message is: the GERD intercepts about 55, more or less, uh, percent of the natural flows in Egypt. GERD is non-consumptive and cannot stop the average flows of the Nile. The operation, though, can delay the recovery during critical periods. Egypt is currently well prepared to manage the filling. However, Sudan is at the greatest risk immediately due to the filling. And a long-term drought management plan is absolutely critical before it occurs. And that is all. And with that, please. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. That's really appreciated. And it is very interesting, uh, rich information. Thank you so much. Uh, we are already... Um, uh, like 15 minutes behind our schedule and now just also moving to our uh, fourth distinguished speaker, Dr. Rawia Tawf uh, Taufik from Egypt. She is an associate professor at the Faculty of Economics and Political Science at Cairo University. Uh, Dr. Rawia, uh, Rawia, we are honored to have you here with us and please the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ravi, and thanks for all the organizers. Um, it's a pleasure to join the, such a distinguished uh, panel um, um, in a timely, uh, uh, you know, to speak about a very timely and pressing issue. Um, I'm trying to uh, share my, my screen, but I think there is the main problem here. I think someone has to stop. Okay, I think Kevin already stopped sharing his slides. So. I think you should. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I think what what I will do in the in the next uh, you know twenty minutes uh, is to try to take a different approach. Uh, so uh, we heard a lot of you know numbers, uh, good background in terms of of legal issues, hydrology, and so on. And as a hydro politics scholar, I will take a, a bit of a, of, you know, a, a political approach, uh, speaking about what has worked in terms of successful negotiations in, in some cases, what, uh, you know, uh, has worked even during the last 10 years of good negotiations, and what has not worked and what lessons can be learned, and what are the basic reasons why a, um, a, um, an agreement on the filling and operation of the GERD uh, has been so far uh, not successful. So I'll start with the enabling conditions for successful negotiations from other experiences as uh, suggested by scholars of photo diplomacy and then move to uh, uh, cooperation on the GERD and as I said, what uh, has worked in the past uh, uh, during the last 10 years. And then uh, uh, speak about the reasons for failing to reach an agreement uh, on the filling and operation. What, uh, what, what are the details that made reaching this uh, agreement uh, impossible so far? And then uh, uh, conclude with a, with a couple of points uh, uh, that may suggest some clues to uh, a way forward. So in the last couple of decades, you know, scholars of water diplomacy has actually uh, you know, studied different experiences of successful negotiations in different international water courses. And they came to the conclusion that we have different enabling conditions at different stages, starting from, you know, the initiation of negotiations and then, you know, sustaining these negotiations and then the implementation of the agreement and, you know, involving any third parties and, and, and also, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of the process of learning that, you know, uh, takes place during this long negotiation. And they identified a number of points that I try to highlight because some of them are quite relevant to the negotiations on the GERD. And I'm glad that Professor Salman uh, already gave 
some background about, about the, you know, the long marathon of negotiations between the three countries. So at the level of, you know, at the stage of initiating uh, these, uh, uh, any negotiation, uh, we have to have, you know, an, a recognition of the value of interdependence. Uh, the role of leadership can be facilitative here uh, in terms of commitment to cooperation, but there has also to be political willingness, you know, to offer compromises and management of the expectations of the public in order to offer these compromises. And I think this is a very critical uh, point as far as good negotiations are concerned, and also an understanding of complexity that with the high level of uncertainty that we're facing in many river basins, uh, there has to be cooperation to you know, manage this uncertainty. But then in order to achieve you know, a, a, you know, a successful conclusion and an, an agreement, there has to be uh, also an attempt by all parties to achieve mutual gains. And this can happen through things like joint fact finding, for instance, because oftentimes you know, uh, uh, um, um, facts that are presented by only one party is being contested by uh, um, other parties and creating more values. Uh, this can be you know, more water in the system, more efficiency, uh, uh, um, or even more benefits beyond the river, um, and uh, also trying to find some sort of uh, uh, um, uh, ways through the deadlocks, through issues like compensation. Uh, Professor Dinar already mentioned issue linkage. But it's very important at this stage during negotiations that all parties commit not to take any unilateral action that will actually threaten negotiations. So it does not make any sense for parties to be you know, involved in negotiations and one party is taking you know, unilateral action that is actually uh, uh, you know, not offering a uh, uh, enabling political environment uh, to make these negotiations successful. What's, uh, what's sometimes also interesting uh, is to have space for what's called ambiguity or strategic ambiguity. Sometimes you have to leave some political sensitive issues aside in order to reach an agreement. Otherwise, you know, uh, you will be actually going through vicious circles uh, without reaching any agreement. Um, in order for implementation to be successful, I think this is uh, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, you need to have sharing of data, uh, joint and efficient authority uh, uh, that is given you know, enough capacities and authorities to mon monitor the implementation of the agreement and also an effective conflict for uh, 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 resolution of any disputes that may occur in the implementation of the agreement uh, and that is accepted by all parties. But interestingly also some scholars spoke about you know, the process of learning uh, that is involved in these long negotiations uh, uh, in any uh, international water course. Um, the process of learning means basically that parties have to adjust their actions. Uh, sometimes this adjustment can go even deeper uh, to reach the, uh, you know, the values and assumptions of different parties. And even the paradigms, the way of thinking that shape both actions and values. And I think this point is, is very relevant and I'll touch on that when I come to the uh, uh, case of the GER. And in all these stages, initiation, uh, you know, uh, negotiation of an agreement and implementation of the agreement, there can be third party involvement. This is especially important in highly politicized context. But of course, third parties have to have high stakes in the involvement of this uh, region and in this case, also high influence, uh, i.e. ability to obtain concessions from different parties. And their involvement has to be not just you know, technical, but sometimes also political and long-term. But what is important here is that even if we have interested parties with enough you know, influence, it is up to the main parties, main core Iberian states to, uh, uh, based on their goodwill, uh, to you know, reach an agreement because of the, you know, the successful uh, third party mediation is conditional on the parties recognizing that there is a high cost of non-agreement and that their goals cannot be reached actually through unilateral actions. And I think this is also a critical point that I will come to when I speak about the good. Of course, I will not you know, uh, speak about you know, the, the, the 10 years of negotiations over the good because this, uh, I need simply ages to speak about that, but let me just try to highlight some milestones uh, that are important and link them their success or failure to the elements or factors that I've just mentioned. So 
first of all, it has to be, it has to be recalled that as, as Professor Salman mentioned, uh, this uh, um, dam was uh, constructed unilaterally while Egypt, as he said, was busy with the, with the ramifications of the 2011 revolution. And uh, 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 just after the construction, uh, you know, consultation started in order to, you know, uh, uh, start a process of examining the documents related to this dam and see what are the potential impacts on downstream Egypt and Sudan. And here I'm quoting uh, one of the uh, uh, um, uh, members uh, of the uh, International Panel of Experts. I think Professor Salman already spoke about the uh, IPOE, uh, which was basically formed of two members of the three countries in addition to four uh, uh, you know, international experts. And he said that, the, you know, the reason why this IPO process was successful in delivering specific objectives was, first of all, political will, or at least, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, desire by the parties to show uh, uh, goodwill, uh, the very specific technical scope of their work, you know, uh, it, it was not about legal issues or, uh, or uh, you know, affected by any political and meddling, but basically focusing on, as I said, uh, um, examining the uh, documents of the um, uh, project and try to offer recommendations. And uh, they focus more on the issues rather than the countries. And they involved international experts with, you know, uh, 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 professional with high professional conduct. And last, the uh, um, construction of the GERD was at the early stage, which left some room for improvement on issues like safety, for instance. Uh, but Ethiopia was determined at that time to keep that track separate from, you know, what is taking on the ground. So only, you know, a, a, a few days before the IPOE submitted its report, uh, Ethiopia already, you know, diverted the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Nile in order to start building the uh, body of the main dam. The declaration of principle was, as uh, uh, Professor Salman mentioned, uh, a very important milestone because for, you know, month and month after the uh, IPO submitted its report recommending that more studies have to be conducted on the downstream impacts of the good, the three countries were not able to, you know, uh, basically uh, uh, agree on uh, what international firms will conduct these studies and, and the terms of reference. And Egypt had to withdraw for about six months early in early 2014. But the change in leadership in Egypt allowed for this breakthrough of signing the DOP to happen. And on the one hand, we can see that the, the, the declaration of principle, which I agree with Professor Salman, that it's, it's an important and historic uh, 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 um, you know, document. Um, on the one hand, the DOP was trying to search for these mutual gains that uh, uh, you know is necessary for the successful of any international agreement on on uh, uh, water courses or on specific projects on international water courses. So it, as Professor Matt Salman mentioned, it uh, uh, you know basically stipulated that joint studies on the GERS impact downstream impacts will be conducted by the three countries. And based on these studies, the three countries will agree then on the filling and operation of the good, and that there will be uh, you know, a coordination mechanism for the operation and filling of the good and a dispute settlement mechanism, in addition to the normal principles of information sharing. But it also added an element of you know, cooperation beyond water, speaking about uh, possible water, possible, sorry, power trade, that good, uh, good's uh, electricity can be actually exported to both Egypt and uh, uh, Sudan. But what was also interesting is that uh, the DOP was ambiguous on sensitive issues, which was important to you know, uh, uh, reach the stage of signing this agreement on the Declaration of Principles. So it's left the sensitive political issues aside, and this is especially the case for water shares, because water shares, as you uh, listen from Professor Salman and, and also from uh, uh, Professor Dinar, are quite contested, and even you know, um, I think the the, the schemes uh, provided by by Professor Dinar in this in this context of you know water allocation and trade uh, is actually will be a non-starter for Egypt, for instance. Uh, but the idea was that let's keep the idea of water shares, con controversial water shares, aside and reach an agreement on the principles of cooperation that I've just mentioned in order for the three countries, especially Egypt and Ethiopia, to be able to have 
uh, you know, an agreement that can be presented to his constituency. But then moving to the from principles to you know detailed um, uh, uh, you know uh, 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 rules and guidelines for filling an operation, this proved to be very challenging in the last five years. And I want here to make a statement, a clear statement that as we heard from you know earlier speakers, achieving Egypt and Sudan water security and even food security, and Ethiopia's energy security is technically achievable, right? economically feasible and also politically desirable because as Professor Dinar said, we have already other you know, uh, uh, um, sources of, of, of instability in the region. So we do not need any uh, further sources of instability. But I think um, uh, uh, the, the main point and the main reason why uh, there has been this you know, um, adamant rejection of Ethiopia to, uh, um, uh, you know, to, to, to agree on uh, the, the draft proposed in, in Washington, for instance, which was the result of nine different rounds of negotiations from you know, uh, November 2019 to February 2020, is basically uh, uh, that it perceived the cost of non-agreement as uh, not as high uh, as the benefits uh, of, uh, of non-agreement. So basically, while Egypt, for the reasons mentioned by uh, Professor Salman, um, uh, the being you know Egypt being uh, the most arid uh, uh, country in the region, um, uh, suffering from water scarcity, and will be you know reaching uh, absolute water scarcity in just four years, it is important for Egypt to reach an agreement. But this is not the case uh, uh, in Ethiopia uh, because basically. Um, uh, the following the development of events, we will find that the optimistic statements made by the three countries in different rounds of negotiations were actually uh, finally, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, threatened by the position of Ethiopia, which uh, uh, suggested to the to the two countries, uh, uh, basically to Sudan and Egypt, in a visit by the uh, delegation led by Haile Mariam de Salim. Uh, the former uh, Ethiopian prime minister, uh, just a few days before the much anticipated uh, 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 signing of Washington agreement, that Ethiopia would like to delay the signing um, because it's facing some domestic uh, issues uh, that relate basically to preparation for elections, and that it will be very politically costly for Ethiopia to sign an agreement now. So this use of political, you know, of, of, of the Nile issue for political ends, of course, you know, has been used for decades by the three countries. But as far as this stage of, you know, uh, uh, signing a much anticipated agreement after five years of negotiation uh, is concerned, I think the main reason was, you know, Ethiopia's, uh, you know, domestic politics and uh, 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 non-ability of the leader to be able to mobilize, uh, you know, the public for uh, compromises. So what we found is actually extreme positions that are trickling down, unfortunately, to the popular level. So it's not, it's not just, uh, you know, uh, 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 um, you know uh, statements, official statements, but also even social media campaigns um, uh, by, you know, uh, the, you know, our Ethiopian brothers that is actually not only celebrating the good as a national project, but also using a very exclusionary language, like Nile for Ethiopia, for instance, uh, you know, uh, 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 trying to portray, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, international river that is bringing this 11 countries together as a national river that Ethiopia has the absolute right to use. Um, and, you know, for this reason that I've just mentioned, Ethiopia simply rejected to sign a binding agreement uh, and uh, they, they just suggested that it can be rules uh, that uh, Ethiopia as an owner of the, of the dam can change, you know, uh, uh, any time in the future and inform uh, the other two countries. And I, as we have just um, uh, heard from Kevin, it's really highly risky for, for uh, um, Sudan and also risky for Egypt, even if the uh, probability is low. And of course, uh, uh, Kevin, I think when, when he spoke about filling, it was basically about filling also in uh, normal situations, but Egypt is very concerned about filling an operation in drought and prolonged drought uh, periods. Um, 
also in the negotiations, it was evident that Ethiopia is trying to bring uh, other issues that is actually complicating the negotiations, like CFA, for instance. So it's quite ironic that while you know Ethiopia has been claiming for decades that you know Egypt is trying to impose uh, historical agreements that Ethiopia actually signed uh, on the Nile, now Ethi Ethiopia is trying to force the CFA on both uh, Egypt and Sudan, linking the good filling. Uh, an operation agreement to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Egypt and Sudan um, accepting in 10 years um, a, a water sharing agreement on the basis of the CFA, which not only Egypt and Sudan, but other countries, as we uh, heard from uh, Professor Salman, have either not ratified or not signed in the first place. Ethiopia, and I, I'm mentioning that also because we spoke about, you know, benefit sharing rather than water sharing. And, and I think Egypt tried to propose something in that direction a few months after signing the CFA, uh, proposing a trilateral and infrastructure fund that can, you know, mobilize funds for the three countries in other projects. But Ethiopians, uh, the Ethiopians seem to have, you know, considered that as a, as a distraction from the a, the main issue of, you know, uh, uh, gird filling and operation and Nile utilization and so on and so forth. So the very idea of trying to expand benefits is is very much also met with some uh, you know reservation by by uh, uh, Ethiopia, and for all these reasons uh, there have been you know disagreements with the role of third parties as you may have been following uh, uh, speaking about you know the U.S. and the World Bank shifting from observers to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, contributors to drafting uh, uh, the agreement that, that was made in Washington although as I mentioned the uh, the World Bank and the and the U.S. made you know uh, or contributed to that to this draft based on the uh, uh, inputs from different countries. Now the same is happening with the AU mediation. Uh, Sudan is suggesting more role for EU experts. Uh, both Egypt and Ethiopia uh, are, are they do have reservations on that, and the result is limited you know uh, influence for uh, both parties for uh, all the mediation uh, efforts that have been exerted so far dr Rao, yeah, the time dr Rao, yeah, the time is over I, I appreciate if you can conclude yeah uh, i'm concluding now um it is uh, i mean can now get to the idea that we have uh, uh, whether i mean whereas we had some sort of adjustment uh, uh, and learning on the part of egypt by trying to transcend all the debate about, you know, uh, water shares and not starting, you know, the, the agreement on filling and operation of the GERD based on the uh, previous water shares or the uh, 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 discussion of, you know, uh, um, the filling and operation of the GERD without the, uh, con the conduct of the required studies on downstream impact, Ethiopia has not changed either its actions or its, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, basic assumptions and claims of sovereignty, uh, of absolute sovereignty over the Nile. Uh, Professor Salman spoke about, um, uh, you know, the risks uh, that Sudan is now uh, focusing on. And this takes us basically to two uh, uh, points that I want to uh, conclude with. Uh, first of all, that when speaking about moving forward, we have to uh, think about, you know, uh, moving from optimal solution that Ethiopia is looking for more to optimal spaces. So we have, at least on the short term, to leave complex political issues aside that cannot be resolved in two or three years and focus on what can be attained in terms of, of this specific GERD project and also build, you know, a support of public opinion, which has not been the case uh, uh, in, in, in the last few years. And for third party intervention, I think, you know, uh, international, the international community uh, uh, need to engage and to remain engaged, not, not just at the technical level, but also at the political level. And, you know, transcend the, you know, the, the feeling of fatigue uh, from uh, different, uh, you know, from following or engaging in these negotiations or, the, or just the diplomatic wish well that we heard following the uh, United Nations Security Council meeting. Um, and, uh, you know, try to reach out to different parties to, uh, uh, um, you know, support uh, reaching a win-win solution. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rabia, and um, I look thank forward Thank you. To yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Rabia. That's a very interesting uh, perspective as well, and uh, uh, it's very interesting. Now, uh, our uh, final speaker, uh, Dr. Semu Moges, uh, he's a professional civil engineer and international consultant. 
Uh, he's also a research fellow and associate at the University of Connecticut in the USA. Uh, Dr. Samu, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and to be part of this distinguished panel. So the floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen first. Yeah, can you see? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm honored to present uh, uh, what uh, recently I composed some of the important issues on uh, Nile. Uh, my topic is a, a GERD negotiation is beyond uh, GERD issues. I think facing the facts together now and facing the consequences later, uh, so I'm a hydrologist by profession, but I'm trying to put some of hydropolitical concepts also. Uh, uh, please allow me to ask all of you, please open up uh, uh, into a broader course than a narrow understanding of uh, the Nile. And also uh, we have to a little bit include some sympathetic uh, human situations. Most of the issues that we discussed so far was on the Nile. Uh, there is a big problem I, I would like to show you on, 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 the, on the part of the catchment of Blue Nile, as, as I think Arian uh, alluded. So my presentation will be background, some background information on the Nile and Blue Nile, and some of the issues that already discussed most of my presentation is also uh, alluded by many speakers. And changing approach uh, to progressive negotiation uh, to build trust and uh, you know uh, cooperate, bring cooperation and if time allows uh, I, would, I would like to show you one experimental example that uh, I did so we have already discussed uh, this uh, the Nile basin there are two water source regions in Ethiopia and the equatorial region the equatorial region is uh, generates more water than it contributes to the source of the Blue Nile because of the swamps. And then the Ethiopian uh, generates more water and supplies more water. So it's a generator and a source area uh, in terms of hydrology. Uh, I would like to go into the hydrology. As you can see, these are the two source regions. Uh, the South Sudan generates more rainfall than Ethiopia even, uh, but uh, most of the water uh, remains in the swamps here. And most of the water coming from the southern part of this area are steady and, and predictable, whereas most of the water coming from Ethiopia is, causes the highest variability of uh, the, the Nile flow. This is a Nile flow at uh, Dongola close to uh, Egypt. Uh, so you can see seasonally also this area uh, from Ethiopia, most of the water is contributed within three to four months, whereas the rainfall uh, from the southern part of the Nile is more of a steady seven to eight months. So more water comes from Ethiopia within a short period of time. And the, as you can see, Ethiopia, 70% uh, of the water, uh, sorry, is locked in the Nile part. The whole surface water of Ethiopia is located in, 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 the, uh, in the Nile Basin and only 30% of the water is generated from other eight to nine basins, uh, which constitutes almost 70%. 70% of Ethiopian land generates only about 30% of surface water. And uh, from literature, you can see 75% of Ethiopia is also dry land. Uh, so this, as, as much as this water, the Nile water is important for Egypt, Sudan, it's also important for Ethiopia. Uh, so there has to be a way that the three of the countries uh, benefit. As I this is a Blue Nile flow uh, already, uh, Kevin have already shown also, it's highly uh, variable because of the variable nature of rainfall. And if I draw the average four to four to five years of flow, you can see immediately uh, the variability, the lower flows 
improve means we have two big dams like GERD and uh, as one and we cannot talk in terms of annual variabilities we can talk in terms of two three four averages uh, average flows because of the huge capacity to to dampen the uh, the, the the hydro uh, flows so uh, this is the hydrology and the, the other important thing I would like to discuss is uh, uh, the, 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 the hydrology of the Blue Nile or the catchment hydrology of the Blue Nile. Recently, with my colleague, what we did was we generated a surface runoff uh, index, drought index, soil moisture index, and, and rainfall index. So you can see in the catchments of the Blue Nile, if you see this one, you can say there is high rainfall where the, ra the uh, high runoff, where there is low rainfall, at the same time, low soil moisture, which means there was intense rainfall uh, where it was not available for agriculture. It was not also available for uh, other activities. So uh, we, you can see the drought conditions, the upper part of catchment varies. Uh, whereas in, in Sudan and Egypt, you can see the most of flow goes even though uh, the the agricultural there is agricultural drought. You can also see these drought conditions, whereby the soil moisture in Ethiopia is better for agriculture, while the rainfall meteorological condition source uh, drought condition, which means there was a very uh, less intense distributed rainfall, uh, and the soil moisture was good and runoff generation was good. So this is another condition that this. The third condition is you can see is that uh, at times rainfall would be high, runoff would be high, but agricultural conditions would be uh, affected. So you can see different conditions of drought conditions in the Blue Nile part of the catchment as, 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 as you closely. If you zoom into different subcatchments, this become more, this is at the basic level. So. Uh, they, it is not a boundary condition, it is not a binary condition. The Blue Nile is not a drought situation or no drought situation. There can be a drought in terms of meteorology while there is high flow. There is also uh, sometimes there is a good rainfall for agriculture, but the, the flow should be low in terms of uh, flowing to Sudan and Egypt. So this is a situation where you can see multiple dimensions of drought uh, playing in the upper parts of catchment. That's why Ethiopia is mostly uh, uh, suspicious of uh, in, in signing some of the agreements as, 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 as I show you later. Now, uh, this is a World Bank uh, publication in 2006 that shows Ethiopian economies directly to link it to rainfall, as you can see, uh, this is rainfall. And in most cases, when there is rainfall shortage, of course, this is the number of people that's, that's getting aid. Even under circumstances where there is high rainfall, there is still many people uh, under aid. Uh, what does it mean? It means that Ethiopia has exceeded its capacity to generate its food from rainfall. So rainfed agriculture in Ethiopia, because of many interacting uh, challenges, especially degradation, land degradation, uh, is uh, exceeded. So there is always a minimum of 5 million people under a safety net condition. As you know, our, the, the situation in 2000 uh, in 1984 where the most of the drought was in the blue in, in the nile part of area in in the tigray in the wallo in, in that part of area if you know so uh, it is not only the flow condition it's also uh, the catchment uh, drought condition that's one of the issues in, in ethiopia uh, i'll go into some of the issues related to uh, the challenge uh, of, uh, I, I don't see, I think, let me see. Yeah, I can see now. Uh, conflict and elusive negotiation. Over the last hundred, probably more than hundred years, because of the Nile, there was war, as you can see in the eighties. 
uh, and when Ethiopia was in in, in internal conflict, it, it, Egypt built hard unilaterally, and of course, uh, again Ethiopia built its dam in in uh, while NBI and uh, other uh, collaborative process are going. Uh, Gerd. So in this process, most of the dams and projects that's going on in, in, in the Nile Basin are unilateral. Uh, whereas the drivers of uh, water scarcity are booming in this region, as you can see, population is growing, uh, water knowledge curve is growing in the region, that people start asking, uh, you know, to, 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 to develop their water resource. Uh, economic growth is also growing. So, and also water uncertainty, climate change and uh, different uncertainties are increasing. So while the drivers are increasing, water shortage is increasing, uh, we can see uh, this would be very complex issue in the Nile Basin. So uh, to show you population in the Eastern Nile in 1960, where uh, the bilateral agreement was signed, was close to 56 million. Uh, now uh, the three countries population is close to 265 million. It would have been easier to have a regional agreement in 1960s, 1960s, 70s, 1980s than now. The population is growing. So it adds additional layer of complexity as we delay agreements in the region. Uh, therefore, I think this is very important that we should go uh, in detail and uh, focus on this. And now I'll go to G Gert. Uh, between 1990, it has been already alluded by many speakers. Uh, NBI, which was established as a transition mechanism uh, in 1999, uh, is still exists, but a little bit weakened position. Uh, there was a cooperative attempt by World Bank and partners to build a joint multi-purpose project. There was uh, an attempt for benefit sharing concept in uh, I think 2008 to 2007. And there was a scoping study already done. I think uh, Egypt, uh, Sudan and Ethiopia accepted that document. Uh, and of course it failed. That cooperative attempt was one of a milestone for all of us, the countries to, to jointly, uh, jointly invest. And then the other was a cooperative framework agreement that was worked was already discussed by many uh, discussants. Uh, it also failed. So there was different cooperative attempts. Uh, there was different joint project attempts. Those attempts were uh, not successful on those days. And then in the middle of this frustration by Ethiopia, it's not because of uh, uh, Egypt was in turmoil, it is the milestone to, to bring GERD was the failure of cooperative agreement. So once the cooperative agreement failed, Ethiopia decided they, they, they want, you know, the population is growing, economy is growing. Uh, so they, they started GERD in 2011. So that brought parties, Egypt and Sudan again uh, to a negotiating negotiate table, which is, which is a, a very good thing. What happened after that? Uh, so in a good phase, three countries cooperated. Uh, there was uh, Ethiopia provided uncharacteristically in the region. There was non-cooperative instance in, in providing documents and sharing uh, project documents in the Nile Basin. So Ethiopia provided all the documents for the three countries. And in, in 2014, I guess, the IPO was established to evaluate these documents, as uh, Raya uh, alluded, uh, Raya, sorry, uh, and and then the tech, National Technical Committee took up uh, to follow up those documents, and then uh, the milestone uh, uh, the declaration of principles was signed by the three countries, which was a good thing. Uh, but most importantly, uh, what I would like to show is. Uh, the three countries established independent scientific community uh, composed of five scientists. And they came up 
with almost a consensus document on the filling and operation of uh, the GERD dam. And that was a milestone for Ethiopia. As they, uh, they thought, uh, I was also part, uh, not part of it, but I was in Ethiopia at that time. I was not uh, here. Uh, so that milestone was declined. That was a scientific uh, achievement uh, that moved uh, GERD negotiation from technical driven process uh, into a political, it might be good, it might, I, 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 I cannot comment on that, but it, it moved the, the technical discussion into uh, the political discussion. Uh, after that, as, as you know, uh, th there has been different uh, negotiations, uh, the attempt by World Bank United States, as uh, uh, Mr. Ria also alluded, uh, there were a lot of uh, up to now where AU processes. And what are the sticking points? The sticking points, as far as I understand, uh, I'm not a hydropolitical person, but one is a prolonged drought years, uh, a compensation mechanism for a prolonged drought years is one of the sticking points. And the second point is legally binding issue. So what Ethiopia, as, as, as far as I'm concerned, is that if Ethiopia signs a prolonged, signs a prolonged drought years with a compensation mechanism that has a legally binding issue, Ethiopia fears that it can no longer develop its upstream catchments where a recurrent drought uh, and population pressure is there. So either uh, that legal binding has to evolve in the future, or these prolonged drought is and compensation mechanisms. These are the two issues that has to be uh, solved as, as far as, so where are we now? We are in an uncharted uh, territory in 2021, and Ethiopia is going to fill uh, the second phase of uh, GERD. So what I would, oh, yeah. So what I can propose, what I can deduct from this is that this indicate GERD, GERD negotiation is not about GERD issue. I think it's beyond GERD issue. It's about positions of the country. It's also about interests of the country. So it has to uh, probably uh, go beyond the specific project negotiation. And it has to go also in a kind of progressive and, and adaptive uh, negotiation. I have a few slides that I would like to show you uh, how I perceive this negotiation should go. Uh, we know that uh, almost the GERD feeling is agreed by three countries. I think the three countries, as far as we hear, is agreed. And these countries to build the trust, they should first agree before this feeling starts on GERD feeling. That would boost the next phase of negotiation because the moment the first this feeling is uh, completed, it's not uh, the the completion of the, the, the GERD. The GERD has three to five years to be filled. So if these countries come together and agree on the terms that they have already agreed on the filling, then that would be one option that they proceed to the next option of operation of the dam. That is, uh, we have three to four years. So the next phase of negotiation and then this, the next phase of a cooperative framework or uh, co cooperation, uh, another form of uh, co uh, agree, uh, it could be agreement. So, so we have to go into a long-term, progressive long-term negotiation approach. This is one aspect. In terms of development aspect, in terms of development aspect, I have drawn this funnel uh, where it shows water utilization as well as water management aspects. We know. Uh, in Sudan, in Egypt, a lot of water is being wasted uh, through a uh, large number of open canals. Uh, and in Ethiopia, uh, we have still 
degraded lands without uh, significant irrigations. What can the, these countries can do? If they, they establish cooperation, if they have water use and management monitoring system in place, then they have to go into a very long uh, progress of negotiation. The first negotiation would be uh, in filling, uh, guard filling and how to go about the negotiation of uh, development because development in Ethiopia is as important as uh, Sudan and Egypt. And then they can go into, this is the yellow part is where there is a lot of water that can be unlocked from wastage. I read a document from Egypt, as much as 40% of uh, uh, water is wasted in Egypt. It's close to 30 to 40 billion of water. Uh, in Sudan also there. Are, so if we can manage the lost water and that lost water can be transferred into Ethiopia's uh, probably small scale irrigation development or large scale irrigation development. So in this way, we can progressively unlock some of the Western water. We can also unlock some of the water supply that's not being used and then continue uh, with uh, Ethiopia's ambition also to develop its food resource. And then we can stop this flood and then countries can go together for a couple of five years, evaluate the development and then continue with this uh, approach of uh, de developing and then progressively and evaluating and developing uh, dynamically uh, into uh, up to 2050 or beyond. No. But Dr. All... Semo, Dr. Semo, sorry, you are one minute behind. You are yeah. minute, one okay. minute over, please. Okay. On all of this, I was a late comer, so can you give me a couple of three, four minutes? <laughs> I, I try to assemble quickly. So in all of this, I suggest without other instruments, as others alluded, uh, economic cooperation should be very important. Uh, uh, countries should cooperate in a different, other than water. At some point, the co economic cooperation must be more than the water itself. Then uh, the water issue becomes a lower priority than economic issue. So countries should go, I, I think in my view, in this way, and we have to treat uh, the, 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 the Nile as a shared resource uh, without going into more of a nationalistic issue. I mean, we have to get out of the no nostalgic national uh, boundary approach of the Nile. It, uh, we have to treat it as, as a borderless resource that's endowed to us all, and we have to share uh, this resource together. Now, how, how do we get additional resource. We can have, Ethiopia has, this is a water, the rainfall distribution uh, in, in, in the Nile. 51% of the rainfall comes from both Sudan and Uganda contributes about 13%, Ethiopia 20 So there is some rainfall that can be salvaged from this, but this, this watershed restoration and enhancing productivity based on that would uh, reduce some of the pressure uh, of irrigation development in, in uh, upstream countries. Uh, the second part is we know also, uh, I did some research, the, 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 the aquifer systems that we have in Sudan and Egypt uh, in uh, fossilized water is very huge. So that part of the water should be also part of this equation because uh, population is growing, the Nile at some point might not be enough for all of these countries. So we have to bring this also equation. You can see the minimum recoverable, the minimum recoverable could be close to 14 to 15 billion uh, amount of water that can add a little bit of water into the system. Uh, when you divide this into, let's say if, if one takes five to billion per year from this water, it, it can at least take the countries until the population growth stabilizes. Uh, the population growth probably starts stabilizing from beyond 2050. So that part of water also would, would can be added as part of the equation. And desalinization, Ethiopia is a landlocked country without uh, additional water resource. This indicates, I have done some calculation, 
the desalinization uh, water, cost of desalination is becoming more and more cheaper than the fresh water resources as we go along. So that, that would in the future can also contribute to this, uh, the Nile saga. Finally, and most important, I would like to share you is that there are water, as I told you before, 85% of large irrigation in Sudan and Egypt are surface water as uh, I mean, uh, surface canal based. And some studies- Dr. Dr. Semo, you are three, you are four minutes above. Okay, I'm finishing. So there are a lot of water that we can utilize from this. Uh, by using uh, a new agricultural technology uh, that uh, countries can introduce, such as smart agri agriculture. In this way, if we open up one, our political space, second, that we can unlock jointly the available resources in the basin, uh, then I think uh, there is a lot of space uh, to, to, to uh, to negotiate and cooperate in the in the region. I wanted to show you one uh, slide, but I think uh, it's overdue. Thank you very much. I'll stop here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I, I, I know that it's not uh, easy to stop uh, someone uh, who is enthusiastic about the topic and the issue. And of course, we are all interested in hearing more about it. But unfortunately, the, uh, the time is not working in our interest uh, always. So uh, with this, I'd like to open the, uh, the Q&A and leave um, the, the session to um, uh, my, uh, my colleague, Helen. Helen, uh, would you like to take it from here? Uh, yes, I'll be glad to do that. Um, we got a number of questions, but they seem to be concentrated on two people, uh, Salman and Rawia. So I think it makes sense uh, for me to try to consolidate uh, three questions for Dr. Salman, uh, and I think it would be useful, according to uh, three members of the audience, if you'd say a little bit about water quality, uh, both the problems and potential solutions, and in particular, uh, we're talking about industrial runoff. Uh, we're talking uh, uh, also about uh, um, soils and erosion. Um, would you like to respond to that, please? Dr. On mute, Dr. Salman. Dr. On Salman? Mute. Yes, I've sent a request to ask him to unmute. Dr. Salman, unmute yourself, please. Uh, perhaps Sorry, we ought to go on. Oops, to the question for Dr. Rawley while we wait. Dr. Then. Salman, Helen, Dr. Salman what? is unmuted. Dr. Salman is unmuted now. Okay, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Okay, the, the question about the water quality. I, I, I as I said, I, I, I'm not really uh, uh, perhaps the right person to, to delve into this issue, but I can say generally that the conflict and the disputes on the Nile waters has been for a long time on the issue of quantity. Who, who gets how much and who gets uh, uh, when, uh, how much and when. Uh, so the, the, the issue of quality hasn't really come in any agreement or any, any negotiations. But of course, there are major challenges uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the use of the Nile waters. And we could see that in, in, uh, in particular in Sudan where uh, sewage water is thrown into the Nile. We see the same problems in Egypt, and there are some talks about some of the fruits and vegetables being being uh, being uh, irrigated from uh, uh, from uh, from water that is not really fit for consumption. So I, I I don't think there is enough. I'm not suggesting that I don't know, but I don't think even for me there is enough writing about the issue of the quality. Of the Nile waters, it is definitely an issue, but it is overshadowed heavily by the issue of quantity. Thank you. And the distribution. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll now turn to a question for Dr. Uh, Taufik. Uh, a a person has asked um, her uh, 
whether she can distinguish between optimum solution where one party deems it an ideal and optimum space, that is the creation of enabling conditions uh, for agreement. And would not a binding agreement or an optimal solution for one uh, interfringe upon enabling conditions which would be building trust and political will? Uh, can we get an answer to that? Sure. Thanks, Helen. Um, I, I don't see a, you know, a contradiction between seeking a binding agreement and enabling you know, the environment through building trust and political will, because we are speaking here again about you know, a specific project that Ethiopia started not only unilaterally constructing, but unilaterally filling, uh, as, as Kevin mentioned uh, last summer. And Thus, we're actually, I, I, I don't know about other cases, but uh, I don't know about precedents where, you know, negotiations and construction and filling are taking place simultaneously. Um, and we can imagine a situation where we have a non-binding agreement, um, i.e., you know, go with the Ethiopian proposal, have some rules and guidelines that Ethiopia can, can then change or modify, and only, according to the Ethiopian proposal, you know, notify Sudan and Egypt. Would that be an agreement? Uh, what is the difference between having, you know, some rules and guidelines that Ethiopia can change and having, you know, no agreement at all? I cannot see a difference. And thus, I cannot see, you know, really a contradiction between having a binding agreement and building trust and, uh, and you know, political will. I, I think it's, it's actually having, you know, binding agreement and respecting this agreement through implementation that will gradually lead to building trust. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I think this is the, you know, the main statement that I, that I would like to make. But there are also a couple of uh, other questions. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to uh, respond to them now, but I'll, I'll be happy to, to do so now or, or uh, later on. And I, uh, may I ask a follow-up question here? Uh, perhaps a part of the reluctance here has to do with a difference, an asymm uh, asymmetry of power and a concern that per third party um, involvement might really uh, not be entirely impartial, but will respond to power differentials. You want to respond to that, please? Sure, I think this was raised uh, uh, by, by Ethiopia during uh, the U.S. mediation in particular, uh, during the Trump administration. And uh, that was really, again, controversial because the U.S. is an ally for both Ethiopia and, and Egypt. Uh, and thus, there was no reason why one can assume some sort of, in, you know, lack of neutrality here. Uh, but uh, I think... On the other hand, Ethiopia actually accepted, you know, the U.S. Uh, to play this role, but then contested that this role shifted from being just an observer to uh, some sort of conciliation or, uh, you know, uh, um, um, intervention in, you know, drafting the draft and so on and so forth. Uh, but then let's look at the, the AU mediation effort, which has been in place for several months for now, and which uh, is, uh, again, suggested by, the, by uh, Ethiopia to be somehow more neutral and is accepted by the three parties. I don't think that there has been any difference in positions uh, if we compare the two cases, the, a, the US uh, World Bank mediation and the AU mediation. And the reason is that, as I, as I suggested, there seems to be no learning process, no adjustment of, of, of propositions and actions uh, with the different rounds of negotiations of the last uh, at least five years post EOP. Thank you. I'll turn back then to Dr. Uh, Salman. Uh, we have a, a question here about uh, absolute sovereignty and uh, whether or not uh, either the notion of absolute sovereignty or absolute uh, integrity and in which has prevailed. Uh, Samu, I see you have a comment. Would you like to yes. begin with a comment and then I'll go on to the question. Go ahead. Uh, it's it's a brief comment. Uh, what I understand Ethiopian position is any agreement that doesn't compromise the upstream utilization of the resources uh, for different uh, purposes, hydropower or irrigation, uh, that kind of agreement is acceptable anytime because Ethiopia is, I think, 
one of uh, the, the only country that rat ratified in its water policy that transboundary water resource should be governed by equitable and reasonable utilization. And everything that projects those uh, values and uh, criteria is acceptable. I think that's, that is a position of Ethiopia as far as I know. Thank you. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, let's go then back to Dr. Salman and uh, this question about uh, absolute sovereignty and uh, equitable and reasonable utilization and the balance of those two ideas. Is it possible to comment uh, for a minute on on the the last uh, question and answer, or should, should I just go to this? I mean, that's your decision as the chair. Uh, excuse me, I don't understand your question. I, I had I have a, a minor comment on the issue of the of the uh, intervention by the U.S. and the World Bank. Uh, I think you should October. go ahead and make your comment. Yes, of course. And then, and, okay, just, I, I won't take long because I know it's we already. I think one one problem, uh, and I, I put that in the in the past to the negotiation. I think one problem, and I'm just commenting on what uh, uh, Dr. Ravia uh, Tofi mentioned, uh, is the 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 role of the U.S. There were really questions: how, how could the USA and the World Bank, with all their leverage and all their uh, uh, their their convening power and the ability of bringing the three parties to Washington, how could they fail? suddenly and fail completely. And I, I think that, that, that's, a, that's a very relevant question. And I think a lot of uh, people in, in the hydropolitics and the political science and law and negotiations raised. And I think that the, the major issue was there was no agreement on the role of the World Bank and the USA in that negotiation. Were they providing their good offices for the parties to sit down and bringing them coffee and uh, urging them to reach a solution or were they mediating by bringing some ideas and pushing the parties or why were they even going further uh, arbitrating between them i think the main reason for the failure was the lack of agreement on what is what what is what are the terms of reference for the usa and the world bank and so that was that was one reason i think one one major reason for for the failure of the usa this is and now it, this is coming to, to the parties now in the role of the oeu uh, Sudan is asking for more active, proactive role for the AU, and the negotiation is now major, concentrating major on in the major part on what role could the, what role should the AU play? What what should the parties agree to give the AU to play? And I think that's a, a major thing. Do they want to sit there and just let the parties to a treaty negotiation, or will they have do, uh, will they intervene? And the question that comes next is, do they have the expertise? Uh, and the knowledge of the problems and the expertise on the problem to really provide solution. And here I'm referring basically to the role of the World Bank in the Indus Waters Treaty, uh, which uh, Ariel can talk more about. And it was a major role because it wasn't, it wasn't really good offices, it wasn't mediation, it was much more than that, coming out with solutions, commenting on the solutions and, and so on and so forth. So I think the major issue is now for the AU is agreeing with the parties on its role and making sure that it has the expertise to deliver that role. On the question about uh, absolute sovereignty and absolute territorial sovereignty and absolute territorial integrity, those terms were used really a long time ago. When we talk about absolute sovereignty, this, this is something called Harmon, the Harmon Doctrine. And Harmon was the Attorney General of the USA. There was a dispute with Mexico and the Rio Grande and uh, the question was, what can the has the U.S. A, the right to do whatever it wants to do in the on the on, on, on the Rio Grande, or does it or is it obliged to take into account the harm that could happen to Mexico? And the Attorney General, yeah. Mr. Harmon, came out with the opinion that yes, we, we can do whatever we want. We have absolute uh, sovereignty on, on in our land and in the water running in our land. And we don't have really to worry about what happens to, to, to any other riparian. And that's called the Harmon Doctrine, and it's, it's called in, in, in legalese uh, absolute territorial sovereignty. Uh, the, the, the opposite of this is the uh, territorial integrity, which requires the country to allow the flow of the river to go uninterrupted or largely uninterrupted to the other riparians. 
And both, both, both are, are, are proven to be wrong and to be, uh, the, uh, and to be uh, unworkable because you, 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 no country has the absolute of sovereignty because the, this is a shared river and a shared, shared lake or shared river or shared aquifer. And the, uh, the, others, uh, the others on the other side, the, uh, the country has the right to use the water in a reasonable manner. So what, what has happened through the years were, where those two principles were really uh, it got eroded and totally, and finally got, got totally rejected. And the current principles of international water law as reflected in the UN convention, before the UN convention uh, in custom international law and codified in the UN convention is equitable and reasonable utilization, which allows every riparian to have share in the river and share in the use of the river, provided that it does not cause significant adverse effect on the others. So you have the, the two theories much more refined and put in, an, in, in, a, in, a, in a logical context of equitable and reasonable utilization and the obligation not to cause significant harm to the other, other riparian. Because if, if, if one country is using the, a large quantity of water and the other country wants to use part of it and it, it cannot be blocked uh, because of the, the country is already using it, they, despite the fact that there may be harm to the other country. However, that harm should be significant, not just, not just harm. And I have written an article, and it was, it was um, uh, an, an, an issue for major discussion and debate amongst the uh, lawyers and the, uh, the uh, people interested in international water law and, in, and international waters about harm being a two-way street. It's not only the, uh, the, the, upper, the upstream riparians that can harm downstream riparians. Downstream riparians can also harm upstream riparians. The title of the article is Downstream Riparians Can Also Harm Upstream Riparians, The Concept of Foreclosure of Future Uses. It is available, I think, from the library of the uh, Hague Academy of International Law. They, they, they have, uh, they, they have they put access to it. And it has been adopted by a number of uh, uh, authors. Um, recently, in the commentary about the UN Convention that came from University of Geneva. Uh, I think I'll stop here, and if there's a follow-up, I can I can take it to, I can take it later. Thank you. I think we need to uh, change focus a little bit, and I have a question here for Samu Mogus. Are there agreements or future negotiations about sharing electricity in prolonged drought years? Uh, please again. I was distracted. Uh, that's all right. Uh, we were. Uh, we have a question asking about drought and whether or not there are agreements or discussions about sharing of electricity uh, during <laughs> periods of drought. Uh, I think I have no knowledge of that, but uh, it's part of this discussion. Uh, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't have any knowledge if they have. I think. Uh, my understanding of hydropower projects uh, is that hydro project, hydropower projects are non-consumptive uh, projects that uh, should not largely be controlled or dictated by downstream uh, users. Therefore, if that happens, then uh, I think agreements can be reached. Otherwise, if down uh, hydropower uh, development is dictated by downstream use uh, the potential of selling hydropower would also become uh, you know undermined uh, so it has to be dictated by that's if that happens then selling hydropower for Ethiopia it's, it will be easier than uh, uh, otherwise that's what thank you thank you I have another question for Dr. Salman. Uh, based on the history of negotiations, how do you foresee the situation? Uh, is it a time now for Sudan to look for its own development project, uh, projects in order to achieve economic and security and not be left behind? I think this is related to the whole question of different levels of development and uh, the ability of downstream users to block that further development and uh, the question is, should there be a race now uh, for development? And that might include uh, uh, what, um, what should be done here by other uh, 
participants. I, I hope there won't be a race because as I kept uh, saying in my presentation, the international water law and international waters are really the optimal use is through cooperation. And I have argued repeatedly during the last 10 years that the GERD should have been a jointly owned and managed project. It could have achieved a lot for Ethiopia, for Sudan, and for Egypt, uh, not, just, not just for Ethiopia. Uh, it, it should have been, it, it should have been uh, uh, jointly managed and operated. Unfortunately, uh, it's too late now to talk about it. Uh, the question now is uh, making sure that the, the GERD is, uh, benefits go beyond, uh, go to the other countries and that the, the, the other countries would really get uh, convinced by, by, the, by the three countries, not the other countries, that by, by, the, by cooperation in the electricity production in Ethiopia is far cheaper than the hydropower, is far cheaper than in Sudan and in Egypt. I read some reports which put it, uh, maybe Kevin can, 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 can add more to that. It's less than 25% uh, than, than the cost of, 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 the, of hydropower generation in Sudan and Egypt. And as I mentioned, the, the, most of the studies, including the, uh, the uh, Corps of Engineers study that was done in the 60s and was updated later in Ethiopia, put the, put the hydropower potential in the Nile was more than 30,000 uh, megawatt of electricity. And given the fact that Sudan really is about 60 percent, uh, uh, the coverage about 60 covered coverage of uh, electricity is about 6 percent, uh, there is there is a, an excellent opportunity that that, that we, Sudan could get electricity from Ethiopia. Sudan has built a uh, Meru dam. It, has, it turned out to be a major disputed dam because of the people that were affected and the uh, the the the, the uh, and the resettlement process. And still, there are cases before the court, and there is a lot of. So there are three projects, three hydro, three three dams, uh, the Kajbar Dam on, on the on the main line, the three are on the main line, Kajbar Dam and Shirek Dam, and uh, uh, but there is a lot of opposition to those projects. And I now that there is a democratic situation in Sudan, I think it will be impossible. I, I shouldn't say impossible, but be very difficult. Uh, okay. For Sudan well, to build I know those. we're we're getting toward the so, end so of our I time. Think so, so I think I think just just to conclude, I think there is an excellent opportunity for Sudan to resolve a good part of its shortage of hydropower from the uh, from the from the GERD and from other projects in Ethiopia, provided that it is done on a cooperative manner. Yeah, I may do a quick quick follow up with that if I could. Um, I, I agree with Dr. Solomon. I think one of the big um, one of the big issues is it's we're already looking into a very strained basin in the future. Um, adding additional evaporation losses um, in Sudan uh, is, is, is a risky endeavor, especially if, if, if the, um, uh, the elevation differences are small, um, you end up having to have very large uh, reservoirs to be able to, um, to generate electricity, or they end up being runner river reservoirs, which don't generate electricity in a, in a, in a um, regular way. So it makes a lot more sense to purchase that electricity from Ethiopia um, uh, than, than to build additional evaporation losses uh, within Sudan. That's a very useful exchange. I need to uh, follow up with a physical question, the question of sedimentation. Numbers of people have asked specifically, I think perhaps prompted uh, uh, by Ariel Dinar's uh, picture of the sedimentation uh, downstream. Uh, what is the sediment situation uh, and how might it be affected by this project? Dr. Solomon, Ayman? Yeah, th thank you, Helen. I think there is also another question related to uh, perhaps uh, Kevin can, can address it because I saw him address this in the answered books uh, okay. related to the impact of climate change on the flow of the of the Nile and how this yes let's uh, yeah. let's address that certainly yeah so so the um, the climate the climate science has been very mixed for a long time on the Nile uh, where a lot of climate projection projections said drier some said wetter so it was very inconclusive um, some of the some of the best work that's come out recently which I um, I think I put in the in the chat uh, from from um, uh, Simon El uh, in um, an MIT indicating an increasing variability 
Um, and, uh, and, and some, some evidence of increasing um, rainfall, as I showed in some of my graphs as well, uh, runoff. So while there's not a clear, a clear indication, um, uh, we are getting some indication of increased variability um, and also a very strong link with the Indian Ocean Dipole. So the same event that's causing the large fires in Australia, um, causing very large um, uh, uh, flooding in, in, um, in Ethiopia, uh, and coming into Sudan. So as we understand that, that increasing in frequency, uh, we understand that those, those teleconnections are also, are also very strong. So yeah, we, we're getting some. And then also there's aridif aridification um, in the hotter areas uh, as well. So the areas in, in Egypt and Sudan becoming more difficult in some ways um, for, for irrigation just for increasing temperatures. Kevin, do you want to deal with this sedimentation question? Is that a something that you can address or do we need to Refer back to Dr. Salman. Or can you repeat it again for me, real quick? Uh, a question about sedimentation and what kind of problem it is, and uh, what, how is it being considered? Okay. Well, sedimentation is a two-way street. Um, uh, the the Ethiopian dam will trap a lot of the sediment um, coming out of the Blue Nile. Um, however, there's still a lot of sediment that comes in from the tributaries downstream. There will be very significant benefits to the sediment reduction for uh, Sudan. Uh, currently, their reservoirs, they, they struggle a lot maintaining uh, their reservoirs um, due to the sediment accumulation. Um, and they have to clean out their canals very, very frequently to, um, uh, as they spend a lot of money on cleaning out their canals. Um, so the GERD will help a lot reduce the sediment. Um, and then there's also the other side of, of, of sediment losses, how that uh, inhibits the transportation of nutrients. Um, but really that, that applies in Sudan. Uh, we have to think Egypt is already dammed. Uh, it's a completely unnatural flow going into Egypt and there's no sediment going into Egypt now anyway. So there will be no implications sediment wise from, um, from, Ethiopia, or from the dam into Egypt, but it will change and clean the water essentially, clear the water out um, in Sudan. So there's a lot of talk about uh, loss of sediment in terms of um, floodplain irrigation, uh, the brick making, um, those types of things. But um, it'll be probably generally a beneficial thing for Sudan to have less sediment flowing in that river. It'll do a lot of geomorphic changes in terms of incising the rivers more and that type of thing. Um, uh, but yeah. Um, but I think there, that's, also, uh, that's very helpful. I wanna check with Ayman about our time. Where are we? We have additional time here. Ayman? Unfortunately, Helen, we are we are almost like 30 minutes above the schedule. And uh, that's what I are, thought. And I, I uh, wanted um, just to uh, quit at a time when it all seemed rather balanced. And I um, want to thank everyone. Uh, I didn't get to all the questions. I did try to collapse some questions. But I think we had a very useful uh, discussion. And I'd like to thank all the participants. Sarush, yeah, have you some closing remarks? Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you, Ayman and Helen, for moderating this wonderful uh, third and last for, the, for this cycle of the Rosenberg Forums. And uh, I'd really like to thank Salmon, uh, uh, Ariel, Kevin, uh, Ravia, and uh, Samu for willingness to participate and contribute to this. Yeah, these are some challenging uh, questions, uh, many uncertainties, climatically and otherwise. Uh, and uh, of course, the politics is a separate issue by itself, but certainly some wisdom was added to this uh, workshop uh, on, on, the, on our call today. And I hope that um, in a future time, we will have an opportunity to revisit this whole question and see how much progress has been made. Again, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sherry and your staff for a really wonderful job of uh, putting uh, these webinars together professionally and nicely. And uh, with that, uh, I wish everybody a wonderful evening, uh, afternoon or morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all.